this meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Uh, we have a pretty good crowd here tonight, so please remember to be turn off your cell phones, please. If you have to take a call, take it out in the hall, please. Um, please be courteous of people who are speaking. Uh, if you are here to speak on a particular item, you can come up when we call for the public meeting, state your name for the record into the microphone, and you'll have two minutes to speak. If someone's here from a community council, they have five minutes to speak, but we pretty strictly enforce that. Um, and like I said, be polite to other people. No booing, hissing, cheering, carrying on, okay? <laughs> Okay, we'll get the meeting started. Um, I need a motion for the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. I'll move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Weston. I'll second that. Carolyn, thank you. Adrian. Abstain. Okay, Brenda. Yes. He's sitting next to Brenda. Oh, Caroline. Agree. Caroline. Agree. Thank you. Weston? Yes. Amy? Yes. Matt? Minutes? It's minutes. Yes. Thank you. Motion to approve, isn't it? Just yes. Confirm. Yes. Sorry yeah. I'm late. No, we, we knew you were going to be late. Thanks for being here. Uh, the chair has nothing to report. The vice chair is not here. Anything from the director's chair? Just a few things. Um, the commissioners, your attendance is imperative the next several months as we have a lot of items coming uh, down the pipeline for your review. Um, if you're absent, uh, not for public discussion, but please give a reason to um, Marlene uh, if you are going to be absent, So we, just so we have like a record of um, what's happening. Um, <clears throat> if you are going to attend the field trip, please be as definitive as possible um, so we know whether or not to wait for you. Uh, and then uh, keeping in mind that those upcoming meetings will be full we the vice chair and the chair have asked staff to try and limit agendas to five items or less um that said it's going to be a challenge um and so if obviously if for some reason we don't get quorum on any given night um that's only gonna throw that five item limit out the window for the next couple of meetings. Um, <clears throat> we uh, have sent out an, an email uh, requesting your attendance at, um, and I guess you could call it an ad hoc meeting on July 31st, because the second meeting falls on um, Pioneer Day. Obviously, no one's going to we don't have a meeting that day, so we are trying to have a second meeting in July, so that'll be July 31st. Um, at the moment, we're trying to limit that meeting to just city-initiated petitions and briefings um, so we can have a more um, engaged conversation about those particular items. Um, we may have to add a, a, an applicant-driven petition to that agenda um, if the earlier July meeting is too heavy. But um, we'll do our best. I think that's it. Thank you. Not, not good news, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's a busy time in Salt Lake City. Yes. Yes. All right, we'll move to <clears throat> Our first item is a subdivision plan development amendment at approximately 1570 South Main. It's, are you doing that one? Okay. I was going to say, you don't look like Eric. So I'm covering this item for Eric. He's out at a conference. So uh, this is a request by Brock 
uh, Loomis for an amendment to a plan development um, that was approved by the Planning Commission September 26, 2018 for a project called Moda on Main, which was a multifamily development at approximately 1570 South Main Street. Uh, major modifications to a plan development require the Planning Commission's approval, so that's why the project's before you this evening. The proposed changes would allow for each of the 11 units to be platted on their own lot, no other, to the, no other changes to the site or building forms that were previously approved by the Commission are proposed with this amendment. Uh, the overall development site meets the um, size requirements for the zone. Each lot would accommodate space for only the proposed unit only, um, parking, open space, and those types of things would be common area. Um, the original approved setbacks with the plan development are maintained with the amendments to the proposal. Um, basically, the amendments would allow for these units to be owned rather than just rented. Uh, staff is recommending approval of the modifications and the uh, preliminary subdivision as requested. Um, we did receive one public comment in support of this proposal and that was uh, late this afternoon and was added to the drop box from an adjacent neighbor. Questions? Um, so are they gonna have a HOA to manage the common area? I would imagine, I don't know if the applicant's here, I've never actually met him, but they might be able to speak to those questions. I would imagine they have an HOA or some kind okay. of agreement to manage the common Somebody's area. Somebody's got to do something with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so seeing no questions for you, we'll let you step back. Is the applicant here? Would you come up, please? And you can state your name for the record. So we know who you are, and you have 10 minutes, but I'll bet there's some questions. Sounds good. My name is Brock Loomis. Um, I'm Adam Paul. I think the staff did a great job of representing what we're doing. I think if, we, if there's any questions, though, we'd be happy to answer them. So, so the you, first one was we will have an HOA. Okay. We will maintain the Something the to maintain space. the common yeah. space. Yeah. Um, any other questions for the applicant? No. Looks and I like heard a question about parking. Um, we can give an update. We, it was a discussion when we came through for the plan development, the parking on Main Street, and we still had to go to the um, urban forester for review. He did want one of those trees to remain, and so the parking was taken from seven stalls to five. So oh, on the street? On Main Street. Oh, okay. So one of the okay. existing trees there is going to stay where it is. Okay. Okay. Um, no other questions? Okay, if you would step back, please. Okay, I will open the public hearing on this item. So is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on that? Is, just one second. Is there anybody from the um, Community Council? Okay, seeing none. Come on up, sir. Okay. Yeah, my name is Robert Lewis. No, wait till you get to the microphone so it gets Loud on the record. <laughs> My name is Robert Lewis. I live uh, in the uh, lot next to uh, the uh, Moda. And uh, I have a couple of questions. One of them is uh, power lines. And the other one is we, there, we've got a fence that's there. Part of it is on the Moda side, uh, as I look at where they've marked it with the... Uh, uh, when they when they put the uh, survey in and at the back side the fence is on our side it's a, a chain link fence and if you look at the pictures of the thing they're proposing putting in a board fence and uh, and also taking out a couple of trees the trees are on their on their side the uh, fence is part of it's on our side according to the the, the survey markers and part of it in the back is, is on their side. I mean, I, I, hopefully I got that right. And uh, we also have a garage that is right next to it. It's an older type garage. I don't know how, what the plan is. If you're gonna have the wood fence, their, you know, the, fan, the multiple board wood fence, if it's gonna go up against that or, or, 
what, what the uh, thing is. Also, the sewage in the area, how is that going to affect everybody else's sewage? You're essentially putting 11 units in, in an area that had a, just a building in it. So is there going to be any, any uh, situation where uh, it, it's going to affect everybody else up and down on Van Buren and uh, Harris? because I don't know how the sewage fit goes. And also the same with the power lines. Are they going to be underground? Or are they going to be going over like our buildings hit, uh, top? Okay. We can, we can ask after the public hearing. Okay. It was, okay. Uh, those aren't public hearing things? Well, it, it, that's we've got your input. Yeah, okay. And then we'll ask the applicant after we finish the public okay. hearing. Okay? That's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? Come up, state your name, and you'll have two minutes. Yeah, my name's Dennis Cavazos. I'm uh, the owner of a neighbor just to the north. Um, I'd just like to ask the committee here if they know uh, parking. I know there's so many square feet in each unit. What's the code for how many parkings area you have to have for this for this development we'll have to ask the planner when she comes back up where when, when would that be and where are they well oh. after the public hearing we can ask some of these questions and see if we can get answers for you so can i get the name of the planner because no, we'll get it answered during the meeting Okay, but it'll so be. So you're saying I can't have the name of the planner because this is something that I'm asking. She's, and it she's sitting like, right behind you, you sir. Planner? But you're on the clock. These are. This is your opportunity so to ask questions. I'm just asking a question. Who's the planner, so I can go direct to them? She's sitting right behind you. It's Molly. Yeah, no, you're Molly. She, sorry. I mean, you know, I'm a. Uh, so who? In other words, she's the planner that I should talk to on zoning questions. Yes. Okay. And we can make that part of the Does public Does she meeting. represent the developer, or is she the person no, in the city? she's with the city. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Come on up. State your name for the record into the microphone, please. Yes. And you have two minutes. My name is Tracy Jensen. I live east of the proposed project. Um, my understanding is that Main Street is about to undergo some changes to improve bike lane accessibility. I'm wondering how that's going to be impacted with the street parking that's proposed with this site. So if that question could be answered. Um, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing on this item. Can we get the applicant and the planner back up here, please? There's, there's room for everybody up there. <laughs> we can all come up together. So you heard some of the questions. Um, yeah, I was just power, jotting down some notes. Power, is the power going to be underground? Power will be underground. OK. We will, we will be bearing the power. And what's going on with the fence and the fence in relation to the garage next door? I will probably need to, it'd probably be good if I came by and met with, I think it was Robert, the neighbor, and just take a closer look at that with the fence and we can coordinate. Okay. We would be planning on putting the fence on the property line. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm probably going to coordinate with him, how big of a, if it's, if it's overlapping, how much it's overlapping. And we, it, it's pretty common on a lot of our projects that we just need to work with the neighbor to make sure. Yeah, I think you just need to meet, I'd be, I'd be meet with to, him. I'd be happy to meet with you and yeah. Come yeah. take a look at it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and then sewer. The sewer, I mean, yeah. It's a public utilities question, but they have reviewed and approved the plans. So... So there's um, enough there's sewer capacity, capacity of a for it. Project, yeah. Okay. And then, did you find out the 
parking question. In terms of parking, I think this is a multifamily project, and in that zone, it's two parking spaces for each dwelling unit with two or more bedrooms, one parking space for one bedroom and efficiency, um, or half a parking space for single room occupancy. I'm not certain on the occupancy or the number of um, rooms within those units, um, but regardless, they have to meet the parking requirement. We don't have a way for them to waive that parking requirement in our zoning ordinance. So. Okay. So do we have any other questions from Planning Commission? The no? Bike, bike path. Hmm? The bike path improvements. Oh, will <coughs> bike lane improvements on Main Street affect the parking? Maybe out of... I, I would say that's a question for transportation, and if they're, they have to review the angled parking anyways that's proposed there, I don't know if... And they have um, reviewed that as well. Okay. Yeah, so, so as part of the building permit, which I would imagine you haven't gotten approval for yet if you're in this process, um, they would make comments on that if, if there was an issue with the bike lane. So it's likely there's okay. not if they haven't made that okay. comment. But there's a bike lane there now, right? Uh, a separate bike lane on Main Street there. Oh, there is. Yeah? Okay. So it's already existing. I don't know what improvements they would be making to it, but maybe painting it or something, but there's already a separate bike lane marked. Okay. So I don't, we don't think there'd be an issue there, or if someone's got a concern, they need to talk to transportation. Okay. Thank you. Um, you guys can s step back. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? A motion? Is my, I do have a question about the tree preservation. Is that included in, would, do we need to do anything for that or is that by nature of the urban forester saying it has to stay? I believe it's um, the urban forester because those streets are public property. Okay. They're in the park strip. So he has the discretion okay. on whether or not those can be removed. Okay, great, thank you. A motion? Uh, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Thank you, Weston. Uh, based on the information in the staff report and the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve an amendment to PLN SUB 2018-00057, Moda on Main Planned Development, and PLN SUB 2019-00133, Moda on Main Preliminary Subdivision. I'll second. Thank you, Brenda. Any discussion? Okay, let's vote. Matt? Yes. Thank you. Amy? Yes. Weston? Yes. Carolyn? I agree. Brenda? Yes. And Adrian? Yes. The proposal is approved. Thank you. So we'll move to the next item, the plan development and conditional buildings, building and site design review at approximately 45 West South, 600, 45 South, 600 West. You're up, Amy. I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I was just trying to give them contact information for the planner on the last project. Good job. That's not me after today. <laughs> so uh, this item is for uh, residential development by CW Urban. Um, it's represented by Augie Wassmond at approximately 45 to 59 South 600 West. The project's before you this evening because all new construction in the gateway mixed use zone uh, requires a plan development approval. Also in addition to that um, plan development request, they are requesting reductions to the parking lot landscaping requirements. And the exterior materials require approval through the conditional building and site design review process, which I will probably just be referring to as design review for the rest of the presentation. Um, planning staff is recommending approval with conditions for the new construction um, without the parking lot landscaping reductions and approval with conditions of the design review for the exterior materials. 
The development includes four separate four-story buildings with a total of 48 units. On-site parking for the project is accessed from 600 West um, and located interior to the project. There's also a mid-block walkway identified on the downtown master plan and that's been incorporated into the project into the project along the eastern property line running north and south. Um, in terms of the specific requests that are the specific requests and modifications that are before you this evening, um, the applicant is requesting reductions to the parking lot landscaping requirements through the plan development process. These landscaping regulations are required when a, a parking lot has 15 spaces and, with it, and is within 20 feet of a property line. A uh, seven foot wide landscape area is required along the perimeter of the parking lot. Those call outs of the seven feet show where that seven foot width is required. Um, the applicant is requesting to reduce the landscaping along the north and south portions um, where approximately 874 square feet of landscaping would be included in those areas. Um, 506 square feet is proposed. The interior of the parking lot, 5% of that is required to be landscaped and that equals about 500 square feet. Um, and it's to be dispersed throughout the parking lot and each area is required to be 120 square feet and five feet wide. And the proposed landscaped areas do not meet those dimensional requirements. Um, the total area of square of landscaped area within the internal area of the parking lot is 380. Um, again, where 497 is required. The intent of the interior parking lot landscaping is to break up large expanses of, pat of pavement, provide relief from heat island effect associated with paved areas, provide shade protection, and reduce impervious surfaces with environmental design that provides areas for storm runoff. Um, the zoning ordinance states that the intent is to require higher landscaping for residential uses, principal, um, specifically multifamily uses, than for non-residential uses. Uh, staff did meet with the applicant and made suggestions for possible modifications to these landscaping standards that could potentially still meet the intent of the re these requirements. However, the applicant moved forward with the design that's um, before you this evening. Uh, the narrative indicates that the reduction would allow for better circulation throughout the site and the ability to provide the mid-block walkway. Um, however, the mid-block walkway is already required as part of the development. It also indicates that the design would allow them to move the parking lot interior to the site, uh, but the GMU zoning standards are re already require the parking lot to be interior to the site or set back 30 feet from the property line. Um, those are built-in standards uh, to enhance the overall experience of you know, the pedestrian experience in the GMU zoning district. Um, the narrative also indicates that this would allow them two additional surface parking spaces on site. Um, the maximum parking allowed for the project is 24 spaces. There are 31 spaces proposed on site and eight off site parking stalls. So they will be going through transportation demand strategy to increase the parking beyond the maximum. Um, so staff's opinion is that given the project's proximity to mass transit and the potential to explore the possibility of off-site parking on the um, underutilized parking lot to the north of this property. Um, and that, that parking lot could also tie into the mid-block walkway that's proposed with the development. Staff doesn't think that reduction of the landscaping requirements is an appropriate modification um, to accommodate the parking that's already beyond the maximum spaces that are required for the development. Um, again, we don't support the reduction of the landscaping for the mid-block walkway or the parking interior to the site because those are things that are already required by the zoning ordinance. Um, as part of that analysis, we considered the purpose of the plan development, which considers the relationship between the proposed um, reductions and um, whether or not they result in a better project than just the strict zoning would require. In relation to the conditional building and site design standards for uh, the proposed exterior materials, the GMU zone requires that all buildings have a minimum of 70% of exterior materials be brick, masonry, textured, or patterned concrete. And then any other material, if it's used um, beyond just minor bu building elements, requires this design review process. Um, staff is recommending approval um, of those of that request with conditions, uh, the elevations that face the public way 
um, incorporate a lot of uh, detailing and projections and recessions with the porch element. Um, however, we are requesting a condition of approval related to the interior facades that are adjacent to the mid-block walkway. Uh, the GMU design requirements require architectural detailing that facilitates pedestrian interest and um, in addition to those, the conditional building and site design review standards um, discuss pedestrian orientation and detailing at the ground level. Uh, the project does have a mid-block walkway. Um, it's identified in the master plan. Um, they've incorporated the walkway along the eastern portion of the site. Um, because they are going through this design review process, that also triggered them to have to include public art within their proposal. Um, there's a rendering of the public art that they've proposed, uh, two different options, and then that arrow points to approxim approximately where they intend for that art to be located. Um, we did get some comments from the Arts Council um, on that public art, and that's included in the staff report. And we are also recommending some conditions of approval related to the mid-block walkway that include providing an unobstructed pedestrian pathway, a greater visibility of the public art which is proposed along the walkway, and um, standards for public spaces um, in the conditional building and site design process for which includes sitting spaces, shade, and um, things like that. So here's some photos of the existing site um, from 600 West. The bottom portion shows the parking lot that's north of the property. And this is the surrounding development um, across the street, as well as just further down the block. And we, again, have analyzed the project for compliance with the standards for the plan development and for the design review, and we're recommending approval uh, with conditions for the new construction without the landscaping reductions and approval of the ex exterior materials through the design review process. Questions for Amy? So let me just yeah. um, restate this a little bit so, <clears throat> so that I can understand it. Um, the applicant is asking for more parking spaces than is actually more parking spaces than the city not only requires but allows, right? Uh, they're not requesting that through this process, but right. yeah, the maximum parking for this um, project, I believe, is 24 spaces. Right. And so they're going through transportation demand to increase that maximum, and I believe they're including some uh, secured bicycle storage, and um, I'm not certain what else they're doing. but Okay. And they are asking also for us to reduce the amount of landscaping in the parking lot. So if we traded landscaping for parking, they wouldn't even, that, that, that particular problem would go away, right? Um, yeah, if you can, it would need to be tied to a standard of how, how they're meeting that requirement. Right, I understand that. Um, and so the city has proposed um, reducing partly to have the have to have a new um, a little bit more landscaping in the parking lot as where the location for the art would be. Is that no? The art's along the public uh, the mid block walkway. Okay, okay. So what was that drawing you showed? That one. Re no, go forward. That one where you're saying remove the parking spaces. So the idea is that the mid-block walkway will connect um, once it goes through the properties to the north and south when they redevelop, but also the connection from 600 west right now. So that driveway approach is utilized for their parking access, but is also a pedestrian access for the mid-block walkway. So that, but, but that one of the conditions you're saying is, mm -hmm. to, is to take out those two parking spaces there and yeah. make... It part of the mid-block walkway mm -hmm. and landscaping and so forth. Not necessarily landscaping, but just an unobstructed pathway to the mid-block walkway so that pedestrians aren't having to 
walk around vehicles. I see. Thank you. That so I mean, really part of oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Is the the path going this way? Is that would that be an easement the way the mid block walkway would be? We wouldn't necessarily have to have them record an easement there, but it is a condition of approval for the mid block walkway running north south to be a public easement. Yes. But it, there's not a condition to have it run east west as well. There isn't currently. However, right now that would be the only access to it. So I think and that would be. Access it from the. Oh, it's blocked from it's both ends. Yeah. So the idea with mid block walkways block. is eventually when those properties to the north and south redevelop, that it will go through the block. Okay. Got it. Thanks. So, and, and with this, are there people walking along the, like the driveway or is there actually kind of a sidewalk or designated path? Are you recommending that designated path be added? So there's currently a path proposed on the south side. Um, I'm not sure how the curbing is intended for that. The applicant is here and they could probably speak better to the design of that. Um, and, and we're recommending extending a pathway also on the north side of that. And then if we approve this, uh, this with the designs as done that exceed the parking maximum and transportation comes back and says, nope, you can't exceed the parking maximum, are they gonna have to come back here? Because, or is, or is that not a significant enough, like, change in the plan development that they wouldn't need to come back here? Well, in terms of their parking, if, if those weren't utilized for parking spaces, I would imagine that they would then put landscaping there, but I'm not certain what they would do with the area that's currently identified for so spaces if, if they weren't allowed to. Transition gives them a thumbs down towards the plan. If we give a thumbs up and transition gives a thumbs down, they may or may not be back here, depending on what alterations they do to accommodate transportation's requests. Yeah, uh, the process for increasing the parking beyond the maximum just requires them to provide amenities such as the secured bicycle parking, which they've proposed. So I don't anticipate them denying the increased parking. There's a process for them to do that. Um, but if for some reason it was denied, I don't think no. that it would be anything that they would need a modification request from you okay. on. All right, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, is the applicant here? Okay, we'll bring them up. Thank you, Amy. And if you would please introduce yourselves and you'll have 10 minutes. up there What do I do? And, and we won't count it against your 10 minutes. <laughs> but, which thing do I unplug? Oh, there it goes. Well, this isn't what I want on the screen. I can just represent her arguments. <laughs> you need to track it over. Is it too? This plug? you drag it over? Is it acting as a second screen? <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why. There we hey. go. We got our tech guy in the house tonight. Way to go. <laughs> yes. Oh, for when we used to use. I don't remember what full screen is on the middle one. <laughs> yep, that one. The square. So tiny. There we go. Probably easier to oh, I think I can drive from there. That'll work. And I think if you could hit, hit go to tools real quick, there's a present presentation mode. Just go. 
Click, click back on your tab and tap through it. Click right there. I'll just. All right. Sorry, we're kind of low tech. <laughs> um, my name is Augie Wasman with CW Urban. I'm John Galbraith with CW Urban. I'm Hui Moraes with CW Urban. Um, so first of all, we just want to say thanks uh, to all you folks for being here tonight. We appreciate it. And also we want to thank Amy, um, who was the planner on this, for unpacking everything. You guys just saw her unpack. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. Um, and she's been really great and uh, mostly patient with me. So I really appreciate that. Um, this quote came out of the, the staff report, and it says the planning commission should determine if the project will result in a more enhanced product than would be achievable through strict application of the land use regulations. Um, to give you a little bit of background on this site, when we put this thing under contract, uh, we reached out to a national award-winning architecture and planning firm, and we asked for their help. And we sent them the zoning ordinance, and we sent them the land use regulations and said, hey, design something to the strict uh, application of the land use regulations. Um, and maybe I should take another step back, a little bit about us. We specialize in missing middle for sale housing. And if you've seen our projects, you kind of have an idea of what that is. But basically, it's not the super high end, high density stuff, and it's not the low end subsidized stuff. It's kind of right in the middle that attacks that um, attainable or affordable with a lower case A, as I like to say. And when we thought about this site, um, we thought that this would qualify really well for that. It's not the super high end stuff that you're seeing going on downtown right now, but it's not the subsidized stuff because that just doesn't fit in our bucket. Um, but anyway, so we hired this firm and we sent the stuff to them and we asked them to design something and this is what they came back with. And this is what you get with a strict application of land use regulations. And as you can see, it's another exclusive apartment with limited landscaping and a mid-block walkway that no one knows exists. To your point, there's no access north or south, so it's just a landlocked mid-block walkway. Um, this has one in there, but no one can see it. So when we got this back, um, we fired those guys, and we asked our local in-house architects and design team to come up with something. But this time we said to them, we want you to read the zoning ordinance, and we want you to design something to the spirit of the zone and keep the neighborhood in mind. And when they did that, this is what they came up with. Um, it's pretty nice. I think one thing that's important to note on this is if you look to the right-hand side of the driveway, and it's super hard to see, but there's actually um, a walkway there for pedestrians that goes down the driveway. And the reason that's important is because that's our way of inviting the community back to that mid-block walkway and giving them an access point so that they can enjoy it with us. We really think this focuses on the inclusive nature of the neighborhood. Um, I know we're required to provide a mid-block walkway, but we're not required to provide trespass rights to the rest of the community across our site to access it. Again, to your point. Um, so the question is, is this a more enhanced product than what you get through strict application of zoning regulations? Our application asked for a couple of things, and one of the things we asked for relief for is from landscape, and it's parking lot and interior landscaping. This is what the zoning requires. This is what we're proposing. This is roughly 1,371 square feet of landscaping as required by zoning regulations, and we're proposing over 5,700 square feet. So we're not asking to get rid of the landscaping, we're just asking to move it to a different part of the project, which you can see here. Uh, again, is this a more enhanced product? So um, the other thing we asked for is for some relief from the material requirements, which Amy touched on, and planning staff actually agrees with us. Um, they did uh, ask for some conditions in the, uh, the approval of, those, uh, of that relief, pardon me. Um, I'd like to just address some of the conditions. Um, you all should have a copy of this in the staff report if, if you want to follow along. So condition one and two ask for a second path. Uh, to access across our lot to the mid-block walkway. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've actually decided to stamp and stain the concrete, which if you look up here, you can see what that looks like. So this provides um, not only a drive aisle, but also an inviting place for pedestrians and cyclists as well. So we feel like that sort of satisfies the second access point. 
Um, the other thing that they've asked to do is to get rid of these two parking stalls, which obviously parking is a hot button tonight, and not just tonight, but across our city. If you live in this neighborhood like I do, you know that parking is a real problem. So we did everything we could to keep parking on site, and I think any of the stakeholders would agree that that's the best bet for the city. Um, part of the problem here is that, again, we're not required to provide this access, and we're just doing it because we think it's the right thing to do, and we think it's the right thing for the neighborhood, and we feel like we're being punished by having to delete these two parking stalls, and it sort of leads us to believe that no good deed goes unpunished. Um, the third and fourth condition asked us to provide some shade trees in the mid-block walkway, uh, and they also asked us to provide a sign stating that it's public place and the hours that it's open. Um, this was a really big application, and we understand how this could be overlooked, but this is actually the renderings that we put in our application, and we fully intend on a planning of providing the benches and the shade trees, so we're on board with that. We also don't mind providing a sign. We just ask that we could pick it so it sort of matches the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, condition five is a, a little bit more, a more of a technical condition. It asks us to move our gas meters um, to the outside walls, so the walls that would be facing the neighbors. The problem with that is that's where our electrical boxes are located, and by code, we can't run gas lines and electrical lines that close together. So we've actually decided to place our gas meters here, and they're in this rendering, believe it or not. They're just really well camouflaged by the landscaping. We're happy to move them to the outside of the building. We would just have to bring these big electrical boxes in, and we just can't hide those. So that's why we have the gas meters where we have them. Um, condition six asks for some additional architectural design uh, in this portion of the project, which is a, a private inward facing facade. And we definitely appreciate that concern. Um, however, guiding principle three of the Salt Lake City Master Plan charges city planners with providing, quote, access to a wide variety of housing types for all income levels, end quote. Um, when we designed this project, we decided to forego a lot of the amenities you see in these other downtown projects going up right now. We don't have a lavish gym. We don't have free breakfast in the morning. We don't have a rooftop pool with mermaids in it. Um, we've decided to try to provide a little bit more of a dif differentiated housing product that's available to all income levels. So, you know, we get that this is a pretty plain Jane looking wall and, and uh, we've actually taken staff suggestions into consideration and we've come up with what we think is a pretty good compromise. So it's tough to see in this rendering, but we've actually added a differentiation in material and we've also added some uh, three dimensional relief to the wall. Um, conditions seven and eight are actually very reasonable and we think that that would hold not only us accountable but it gives us a way to deliver what we say we're going to deliver so we don't have any issues with those in conclusion i'd just like to thank everyone for their time and again especially amy's effort on this um, i know we all have the same goals which is to bring quality projects to our city in a responsible manner these buildings are going to be around for a long time and we want to make sure that they're done right. I appreciate staff's concerns, however, I'd ask that the project not be broken down part by part and instead be considered as a whole. I came here tonight to ask for approval on all of my requests as a whole and have provided my own recommendations for conditions that adhere to the spirit of the zone while providing economical solution to planning staff's concerns. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any questions for the applicant right now? And I have those uh, recommendations if you guys want a copy. If you have a, if you have a copy, so we'll have to keep the copy. You can keep them all. Okay. Real, real quick, too. There, so here there is or is not really a, you've kind of, you've stamped the concrete, but there is or is not kind of a, a walkway. Yeah, so you can see there's a reveal there. It's really hard to see because it's far away and we're low-tech guys. But there is a reveal to try to differentiate pedestrian space. Our goal here, we actually, um, we drew some inspiration from the gateway where the cars are going really slow. You feel like you're interacting with them and it's not a, it's not a clear space. Part of the other issue we have is we've got to adhere to some fire codes. So we get really constrained by the narrowness of this space. So our goal was just design it where a place of pedestrians, cyclists, and autos could pass all at the same time. Uh, and then, the the north south walkway how is that just like a four foot sidewalk is that essentially what it is what you have planned or what is mm, i'm going to turn to my architect for answers there is the, the 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 space is 10 feet the the site itself is six feet the about. one that goes the one on the back of the the, the mid block walkway the space yeah. is 10 feet but the sidewalk itself is four it's four yeah
Any other questions right now? Maybe just one point of clarification on the parking. Um, we have met the requirements to increase our parking maximums, and we've done that at the request of stakeholders. So we, we qualify back to kind of the transportation question. We've met the transportation demand strategy requirements, and we do qualify for an increase in parking. I mean, it, it's, it's really rare to have a, a developer come before us and exceed the parking requirements. And I, I mean, I know you've got a certain style, and we've seen your stuff come through before and, and improve number of the developments, but um, with this project, I mean, what is, what is the interest that you're trying to achieve by expanding parking? I mean, because this is a pretty urban area. It's right next to the intermodal hub. It yeah. presumably is a place that... Um, you know, people with mixed incomes and stuff will kind of be and be kind of living. I'm just curious what your kind of th thinking is there with expanding the parking. Yeah, it's a great question. And our thought there is that we're trying to get um, a different person than is just going to jump on tracks and go to work on Main Street. And that person's going to go recreate on the weekends. And it's really hard to take public transit to go fly fish on the Provo River. So our thought is they're going to have cars and they're going to need some place to store them but we're hoping that they'll gravitate towards public transit for their Monday through Friday commute. So that's why we are trying to increase what's parking. And what's your ratio here of parking to units? Yeah, so the proposed site has 31 stalls and 48 units. Um, we've added, I don't know if I have any images of it. We've added eight stalls, yeah. We've asked to add eight stalls on the street here in the park strip, and we're working with transportation to have that approved. But that's obviously not part of our project. The only thing is the 31 stalls in the, in the center there. And you, you, these are all... And I'm, I'm trying to they're, they're for rent. Well, they're what? They're for rent. They're for is rent. that what you were going to ask? Yeah. So yeah. You're, you, you're guaranteeing parking as part of the lease with each rent? No. So we're actually going to sell the parking um, because we're hoping that we get kind of a blend of people who don't want to have to have a car or don't have a car, and then also those that do want to recreate on the weekends or need the reliability of a car to get back and forth to Silicon Slopes or something like that, have the car and can pay for so it. So it would be an additional option on your lease to buy. Yeah, and I think it's pretty inexpensive, like 30 bucks a month or something. I live in this neighborhood and I pay for parking. And maybe one thing just to clarify, uh, the mixed units on this building, we go to a one bedroom, two or three bedrooms. There is not a lot of uh, places in downtown that you could rent a three bedroom in case uh, someone that actually has a family and wanted to, to have the kids living with them, they might need a car to take the kids to the school. And so if that's what we feel like parking, it would be kind of something required to, to facilitate people to feel the desire to live in that neighborhood that right now, as you guys know, is a little bit in transition. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I know one person in the city without a car, and he runs green bike, so he, he can't have one. Yeah, and by no means are we pro-car. You know, we want a, a nice um, urban environment where it's with, and we want to promote walkability. Um, so through that, what's kind of given us these... Um, this option to advance is, you know, the, the two things we did is we have um, covered bike storage in each of the buildings so that people can have a secured covered um, place for their bikes. And also we've sponsored um, Green Bike. So to help promote that program. Do you know who owns that parking lot to the north of you? Yeah, that's owned by the Boyer Corporation. And um, I totally appreciate the idea of working with those guys. And I'm friends with quite a few of them, but um, there's a tremendous amount of liability involved with both parties for us to lease some space from them and provide an access easement. And uh, it, it just, yeah, it causes a lot of issues for both parties. So, and we, you know, frankly, the parking situation in this area is, is pretty rough. And so we did everything we could to bring it on site. And in our opinion, this is a, a private solution to a public problem. Um, those cars got to go somewhere. Anything else? Anything else from anyone? Okay, we'll ask you to step back right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll open the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone from the community council here to speak on this? Okay, is there anyone from the public who's here to speak on this item? Anyone? Going once, twice? 
Okay, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Do we need staff and the applicant to come back up? Do we have questions for him? Adrian? I think I have questions for Amy. Okay, Amy. So on the landscaping, if they move it from inside the parking lot to the exterior, mm -hmm. if I understood that right, is that a concern for, for staff? Uh, the plans that they showed in terms of their parking lot around the exterior um, is what we did our analysis on. So, so the, the what they've said tonight doesn't tonight, change that finding. It doesn't change that finding? No, because it's the same as what is in the staff report, if that but makes sense. But if the requirement was to just not eliminate the parking by having additional landscaping in the interior, mm -hmm. but requiring additional parking on the exterior so that the total amount of, I mean, landscaping on the exterior, mm -hmm. so the total amount of landscaping is the same. Yeah, so it's specific to parking lot landscaping. Okay. Um, they also have a requirement because of the square footage, which has been taken out of the new ordinance, but they're in the old ordinance related to um, how much open space is required for the site. So in terms of that um, requirement that's in the analysis in the conditional building and site design section, um, it, it's not really additional landscaping. Um, we've staff has said because of its proximity to some other open space areas such as the 600 um, or I guess the 500 west medians the park block medians and as well as other areas like the gateway mall uh, that we think that the open space meets the like the intent of that requirement but it doesn't change our analysis in terms of the parking lot landscaping the commission however could make different findings regarding that but it doesn't change our analysis because what they showed tonight is the same as what we analyzed in our proposal okay. yeah and then what are your thoughts on the stamped and stained concrete versus a separate walkway. Um, <laughs> I know some of us like scored concrete. Uh, I think I think the paving is fine. You know, it, it shows a shared space. I think maybe separate pavings for the two different pathways in terms, you know, not having all of the same paving for the cars and the pedestrian way. Um, but I don't have strong opinions on that either way. If I could just interject, when Amy and I talked about that one, um, I think we actually agreed. We, we liked the idea of having the walkway along the south side of that driveway to help define kind of the safe pedestrian area to walk and where the cars would go. But actually twinning that on both sides helps visually narrow the driveway without physically narrowing the required width for fire access. So it would actually help the drivers coming in and out drive slower because it visually feels tighter because the drive width looks different because the defined areas for walking would be like a different colored concrete or something like that. That was the, and that was no, the idea behind that condition. There's no parking at all along that stretch, right? That, that's no, purely so that, just access. Yeah, that's the driveway approach for their parking access, but it also doubles as their required access for fire. Um, and, and that width is required by fire, the 26 feet. Any more questions for Amy? Did you, I mean, talking about the gas meters and thing did you um how strong do you feel about that condition? so uh there's a condition of approval rated uh, related to screening mechanical equipment associated with it um i mean i think if those bushes really do cover them that well that it's fine it's just more of a screening thing um and in and just improving that pedestrian experience along the path not so much that where they're located but more that they're appropriately screened like so five yeah. rings, gas meters for the building will be located on the interior side of the yard of the parcel as opposed to on the driveway but if you were to, if we were to say gas meters will be appropriately screened 
like landscaping or other? I mean, is that is that more the issue that we're trying to get at? Than, yeah, than and like where they're located. Right, and if there's just even enough area along there to also provide the pedestrian path and the required 26 feet. Um, but yeah, if they were appropriately screened and completely, you know, covered by a wonderful floral bush or something, I think and that would if be. If you were to use the word, if we were to use the words appropriately screened. Do you think we'd need to articulate what that is, or can you just put up like a box around it? Would that be considered screening? That would be up to you. <laughs> I'm wondering what screening the city considers is appropriately screened, or what in the ordinance or other places? Yeah, I mean, I think in some of our other ordinance sections, we say you know that landscaping could could be used as screening. Um, in terms of like garbage areas, they can be screened with fencing. Um, but again, whether or not they have enough area to provide something like that, I'm not sure. Does the applicant have another answer for that question? Maybe you can. You need to. You need to come, come up. up, please. So this is actually my fault. Amy asked me about this, but in the application process and all of our email exchanges, I just didn't give her the appropriate response, which is that by code, we can't run electrical lines and gas lines that close together. Yeah, you mentioned that. So that's why we moved the gas lines where we put them. And we also can't screen them technically because they've got to come in and, and read the meters. Um, but what I didn't communicate to Amy is that there was a code issue there and that also we were planning on landscaping that area. So we, we can put the electrical boxes in the drive aisle, but they're the size of that door on every building. And so that's much uglier in our opinion. And you couldn't move them to where the parking lot is? Well, that's entrances into the building and the units there. No, it's it's corner, the lesser of two evils. Or? Where are the electrical boxes proposed? They're on the north and the south boundaries right now. Oh, so okay. the top and the bottom. And then entrances from the parking lot run on the east and west side of the parking lot. So you would be walking into your house with gas meters or electrical boxes there. But yeah, you know, if those curve outs right there in the in the parking lot, those little like Half circle, quarter circle, uh -huh. landscaping things. They couldn't. You're, you're saying that the gas meters and stuff couldn't fit on that. Uh, I don't, that's an architect. Those corners. I don't think because a fire engine could run them over. So then you got other issues. I think they have to be. Maybe John. Oh, hold on. Ah, here so, he is. So yeah, I can. I can. Uh, can you go to the front elevation? So both the east and west elevations are somewhat the same, and we have a lot of glass on those facades because they face the street or they face this, the mid-block walkway, so we want the eyes on the street. There's code requirements that uh, meters, um, whether it's electrical or gas, and only they have to have a, at least a three-foot separation from a, an operable window to where they're mounted, and we just don't have that real estate to put that amount of meters on those facades. So one, we want to keep those nice because that's where people approach the building and enter the building. And so switching them to those sides is the less dominant facade that, that will have human interaction. And so that's why we put them there. So the, 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 the challenging part that I'm trying to juggle is one, we can't override code. So like whatever code is like, it's yeah. code. Um, and I mean, I understand, you know, I mean, the staff's kind of recommendations and their thoughts and their, their thought process and why they've done this. And I'm trying to figure out how we both address, because I think her concerns or her comments are valid and they meet oh. the standards of the code for which we were trying to follow and the conditional and, and, but also balance obviously your actual code requirements. Yeah, for sure. So, and we, we spent so, quite I mean, a bit of time. Since I'm not, I'm not qualified to know what's code <laughs> and what's not code, nor am I qualified really to fully move around your thing. I yeah. take advice of staff to kind of gauge so, for that. So like, I can't, that, that, your argument that says it's not, it, the code doesn't work is it's not gonna be persuasive so, here. Like I, I, I'm gonna need someone else to yeah. guide. Yeah, so that. essentially I can give you the solution. So if we, if we wanted to keep that um, access way um, sacred and clean of any utilities and move them to, let's say, the east-facing facade of the street-facing street building, 
that would mean that for the ground floor we, where we're trying to provide as much glazing as possible to have eyes on the street, we would have to reduce that glazing. So we would have to, so we'd have towards some more lot. solid walls to, to towards the parking. Yes. So, which we, you know, as, as security is to try and have access back to the mid block walkway as, and also security for people. We just want to try to keep that ground floor as porous as possible where people are, are walking and parking and such. And so that's why we felt, you know what, let's try to move it on the, on these least, these less dominant sides where we can hide it with um, landscaping. Okay. Uh, so this is other questions about this. I've got to move on. With Sorry. Um, with the mid-block crossing, to me it seems really narrow. Is there anything in code or requirement or plans that, I mean, a four-foot, it feels like, even on the pictures, it just looks tiny, right? I mean, yeah. and it doesn't really, to me, when I think of what the intent is with all those mid-block crossings and that we've tried to do as plans, we try to make places where people can go, and a four-foot sidewalk that looks like you're going down the back of a building that's right up next to it, looks like you're going in an alleyway. It doesn't even look safe. Um, the adjacent property when it's redeveloped. Yeah, I mean, adjacent property could open that up, and there's a lot of, like, unknowns. But wouldn't their that, obligation be to do the other half? Not as designed. Yeah, so it's in the middle of, so there are parcels to the north and south where the walkway would connect. Um, to answer your question about specific requirements in terms of the width of like any width requirements. I don't think in this particular zone we have any standards adopted into the ordinance, but in other zones where we also require a mid-block walkway, such as the TSA, I believe it specifically says 10 feet in width. Um, we do have some draft design guidelines, I think, that also echo that. Um, and the downtown master plan specifies 10 feet, I believe, yeah. or it references the guidelines. So they have 10 feet from, I think, the facade of that, of the, I guess, the east facade of their buildings and the property line. But the actual pathway, um, that includes everything. If you were in a TSA zone or a downtown zone, putting one of those in, is it still the same? Is it 10 feet with a facade or is, what's the code in those? I think it specifically says a 10 foot pathway, pathway. Um, but I don't know. And this is in the downtown master plan. It's not a downtown zone, but the what Molly referenced is in the downtown master plan. Um, okay. okay. Anyone else? Brenda. Um, so I just have a question and maybe I'm off on some of my, um, some of my measurements. I'm looking at your parking lot and I'm noticing that on the west side of the parking lot, uh, you have an extra, oh, maybe five or six feet um, that you don't actually need um, for parking. In other words, between the two stalls that line each other, and then you have the 20-foot 20 20 uh, um, uh, way to get there, it's really hard to see on this. If you're looking at it like I am, you can see it very clearly. Behind the parking spaces that are on the west side, there's about five or six feet that seems to be kind of extra. In other words, your parking area is wider than it actually has to be. Isn't that correct? Yeah, so the, the shaded area that you see is fire code. Right. The distance between the stalls is parking code. Um, not, no, not 27 and a half feet, no. So I'm, required... I'm not quite sure, but it's more like 22 feet. So it seems to me like you might have five feet there. So they have 20 feet in between from the rear of the stall to the rear of the other stall, and that's required because of the oh, hammerhead. That's is not that what you're talking have. about? If you look at the drawing, they have 27 and a half feet. Uh, excuse me. There's a measurement on there, but I don't think... The, the distance between like the edges of the parking stalls is yes. because we need to provide a fire apparatus hammer head so the fire truck can turn around and and drive outside of the of the property the, the fire truck has to come to that center space because they're all separate buildings I see what you're talking about now the measurement of the 20 feet I'm not sure if the 20 
if it's 27 feet that is required or the 20 feet for the hammerhead? I think it's 20 It's 27. Feet. Uh, but when you, you put it the, the hammerhead, the hammerhead is 20 feet. But when you get the radius of the hammerhead. Yeah, because you got the radius. Because here. of the location the of radiance. the radius. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying for the radiance. But when you don't have to have that radian anymore, you could pull the parking spaces back and add yourself five feet of green space. That's a drive aisle, and parking code stipulates how far apart end of stall to yeah, end yeah, of stall. Yeah, yeah, I know, but they, it's 22 feet, not 27 feet. For the width of this stall, it's 24 foot one is what it required per uh, planning ordinance. Width between draw in the drive aisle of a yeah because this a, is a this is a eight six by seventeen six stall so per the table of ninety degrees it it requires a twenty four foot one inch drive aisle okay and I, I don't know if you can see like do you see the curve on the planters over there yes so I see you, the radius yes I understand uh, what you're talking Brent, about Brenda's saying that essentially after the first couple stars where that radi radius ends you could right. shift up to the 24 one to get just a little bit more landscaping between that, the sidewalk and the parking saying, right? and even a couple of trees oh, yeah. in there we could do that okay, yeah we could totally do that totally and then add more square footage to your green space yeah mm -hmm. yeah excellent observation so on both sides yeah we mm -hmm. do that deal So I want to make a suggestion regarding those two parking stalls that are obstructing the view. So um, my doctor's office, they have a walkway and parking. And what they ended up doing was creating a more narrow, right? So it was, so they still had all the parking and they, they created and they striped it so that you know this is where you can walk through and you can't park there. And so if you lost one stall and did something like that to visually connect and keep that unobstructed, because it actually does make a big difference. Um, you know, that's, you're losing one stall, not even the full width, like you wouldn't need 27 and a half feet for that. But um, that could be an option that I would be open to supporting to try to get to that unobstructed way, but you would also then have to visually somehow mark it so that people knew that was not a parking stall because people will try to park there. Um, so keep that open for pedestrians as your your tenants walk through. We actually have that in here. Um, if you go to the if you go down to that zoom, just yeah, hit. my rendering, I do not see. Okay, so this is actually a different one. Um, if you can go just arrow down. And even in a previous one, yeah, th there is a space between the ADA oh, stalls, oh, and we're using that space. That yeah, is but are dry. you then are you taking the ADA um, that extra space for the ADA stall and and multi-purposing that for also a walkway? Absolutely. Yes. I I don't know that that's appropriate, so but if we just shifted that ADA stall up and move the other stall down, that would put the ADA hashing right in the middle. And I understand your concern, which is that they need to be able to access that. And the point isn't for somebody to go stand there and block people. The point would be to walk through it and make connectivity to the mid block walkway. So maybe something we could do is just shift that ADA stall up. And that I think would you would it. also need to do more than just hashtag striping it. Because if I were a pedestrian, I'd be like, well, that's the ADA parking. You, you would need to be a little bit more visually creative to also let me understand that as a multi-purpose access. Absolutely. Um, because obviously having that be the ADA extension is, is very important to that stall. Absolutely. So, but you would need to do some sort of visual and you would need to align it. So if you, so it's centered, so it, so it has that visual connection. I can see that. And then if you do something better on the ground to, to identify that it's multi-purpose, I would be willing to support that, but you would have to you would have to move it. Yeah, and something to point out is our plan to stamp and, and stain this concrete was to sort of satisfy that idea of having two walkways, and we thought that this would be better, but it almost sounds like maybe we should go back to two walkways with different colored concrete to make it really clear and then incorporate maybe those two coming together as a pathway into that mid-block walkway, and we can just continue the color it's an improvement yeah because because you know we're here looking at this but we also 
I have experience with these in my community and how people uh, interact with it. Yeah. So, so that's kind of what I'm bringing here is like, this is, you know, you can have this conception and, but that's not how people end up. So yeah, having the different colors, having those visual cues, cause we just did this in, in my community like last year and, and it was a big deal where the road was bisecting and it was a big deal to have them be differentiated for coloring for the motorists, for the pedestrians. Um, but I think having it visually line up as well is also very important. I would be willing to support, you know, if you're willing to do that, I'm totally, that's, that's fine with me. But I do think it's important to have that opening and not block it with vehicles because it, you do, you as a pedestrian, you just feel like, oh, well, now I got to like worm my way through. Yeah. And, and I don't think you want that. We maybe could have started by saying that we're here to figure out solutions, not to say that this is the best design. So yeah, we're totally open to doing that. And I think yeah. it's, it's great input. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, I agree with Amy on this. And I think that, um, you know, the other thing you could do is to ditch the teeny tiny useless green spaces you have. I'm sorry. And, <laughs> uh, and, um, and move them toward the center as well. We'd love to do that. Because then you, you're concentrating your landscaping where you can actually be something yeah. rather than just having this kind of useless piece of... We're totally into that as well. Yeah. Any other questions, suggestions? Other than that, I, I, I kind of agree that we're a little, in, a little bit in advance of having so few parking spaces, especially for places that has a three bedroom units where it's quite conceivable, you know, there would be two parking spaces required for that unit and, um, and you know, half or none for a lot of other units. It might be possible, but it's going to, I think it's a, maybe 10 years ahead of its time. Well, thank you. So Amy, I have a question in light of the conversations of concentrating some of that green space um, and then shifting that like, for in terms of emotion in relation to how it's modifying the conditions you've laid out. How Do we need to do a whole new one with new conditions? Um, so in the motion sheet, there's recommended motion. Then there's also a motion if you modify or remove conditions um and then there's not the recommended motion so, so those are all listed out so in your probably motion sheet. what you like, need to do is look at the motion sheet pick the ones that you agree with okay okay that's a good yeah, it has some and then, pretty clear directions under that well, and section. then and then come up with the language for the new recommendations i'm going to admit I never look at the motion sheet until the meeting because I'm reading the <laughs> staff report. So <laughs> I will do that now. I'll see you there. Don't worry. So any more, any more questions or shall we try a motion here and let Amy craft the new recommendations? Well, why don't we try to craft the, our proposal for the changed motion first, first before we, and then, okay. and then before we start a motion. Before we start the motion. <laughs> okay, let's, let's look at what the, what the existing ones are. Two parking spaces in front of the mid-block walkway to be removed. I think what we want to say there is that open space there will be consolidated with the um, existing or the proposed um, handicap space so that access into the Midbach walkway is um, uh, visible um, from the from the street essentially um, right um, and pedestrians are directed there by the allowed there in any okay. case um, I feel like number two still meets that like you know that the paving is proposed, you know, to be different, which is what I think you're all you're okay with that. I mean, I don't want to dictate what the material is, but understanding that that visual needs to be somehow achieved. We agree that that should be differentiated, and yeah, that was just an oversight on our part. And yeah. number three, uh, I think everyone's agreed to that. Uh, uh, number four, everyone's agreed to that too. Uh, gas meters. 
uh, and all utilities will be sh by uh, will be um, are we moving the gas meters? I forgot. Do we even no. care? No, I think we just need to make sure they're they are screened really screened, screened with landscaping. Yes, not with a big box. Box. Thank you. Um, the additional architectural detailing on f building facades. Um, um, as shown in the applicant's drawing. The applicant's drawing meet the standards or no? No. The new one, the one I showed tonight. The new one that they showed tonight, it wasn't part of the record in terms of my analysis. I don't have anything other than the PowerPoint that they provided me. It's, it's this basically afternoon. a, well, it's on their plans. Yeah. It's basically, or notes. Yeah, so you're saying the, the rendering you showed, yeah. the side view. It's, it's not, I think it's supposed fine. to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, stone, but in fact, instead it's a kind of composite. Uh, looks, like, looks like wood. I think it's more important that, that you did have some differentiation in the middle. So if, if you intend to do what you showed in your presentation... Yeah, we'll, I'm we good will, with that. We're and then, not fake left, go right type people. We'll absolutely build that. <laughs> well, well, unfortunately, approval, I've seen that. So. Final approval for, for architectural detailing and signage and street lighting and streetscape details and hardscaping and landscaping and parking lot rearrangement is to be delegated to planning staff. Okay, would you, would you say those again, please? No. <laughs> a little bit of concern with the landscaping. We are here to ask for relief from landscaping What they mean here is landscaping in the sense of a plant here and a plant there and Got the green it. stuff here. Okay. Thanks. I will make that clear when I do this again. Number seven, final approval of the details for parking lot revisions, signage, street lighting, landscape details, <clears throat> streetscape details, hardscaping and landscaping details to be de de delegated to planning staff to ensure compliance with the standards for conditional building and site design and plan developments. I think Brent all other mentioned. applicable zoning regulations and requirements from other city departments will also apply. I think that's a great overview. You should make the motion now. <laughs> Okay, I move that whatever I just said, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you have to. <laughs> is, is the, in, in the motion that's on here, is the denial of the request for the reductions of the land, parking lot landscaping, is that, has that been cleared up with the option to move those lots out, or are we, has that been clarified? Well, Not to me. I'd love a little okay. more direction there. So can I make a motion? Because that may clarify the, this. Yeah, okay. 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 <clears throat> Recommend motion. Okay. Based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, I move that the Planning Commission approve the plan development request PLNSUB 2019-00128 for new construction in the GMU zoning district, um, period. Additionally, I move that the Planning Commission approve of the conditional building and site design review for requested modifications of the GMU urban design provisions <clears throat> related to exterior material requirements. <clears throat> this recommendation is based on the conditions of approval that I just listed, which we're going to call listed below. Final details regarding these conditions of approval are delegated to planning staff. Is that adequate? I need you to make a finding on um, why you do not gr agree with staff's recommendation to deny the requested reductions to the parking lot landscape requirements. How's that, how is that um, worded? So in the anal in staff's analysis in terms of our recommendation, um, I've tied each of the conditions to what standard I believe that they do not comply with. So if you look in attachment G, H, and I, um, you could refer to those and you would need to make an alternate finding if, if you're not going with staff's recommended motion.
Anybody can help. Well, is it, is it, it possible with me. your recommendation that that eliminates the need because then they will satisfy the, the requirement? On your recommendation to pull know. those they parking spots closer. out? They could be pretty close. It, so I calculate that, that at about 300 square feet on each north and south. So that would be another 600 square feet. And how much short were they? So on the north side, it's supposed to be seven feet wide. On the south side, there's perimeter parking lot landscaping, okay, seven right. feet in width. One of their areas Perimeters, is four feet yeah. in width. Um, and then on the interior parking lot landscaping, um, I have the exact amounts somewhere here in my notes, but but they were off by the view. She can give or take, you know, 100, 100 plus square feet on both of those requirements. So could we tie it to the total parking lot landscaping? Or does it have to address the seven feet and the seven feet? So staff made findings related to the parking lot landscaping in our analysis, and you would need to make an alternate finding. Both of those are within the parking lot landscaping, and some of them relate to um, appropriate buffering and landscaping, and those are conditional building and site design standards as well as plan development standards, which is the process they're trying to request the reductions through. Well, I'm afraid I don't have time to write a whole staff report right now. So you're saying that um, to change this parking arrangement, we need to make a finding that... Make a finding that you think they satisfy the standard in some other way. Sure. And maybe just a clarification. On, uh, on one side, what we are requesting the most is whether we have a trash enclosure that is a screen. Beyond that is a landscape of the parking lot of the, the project to the, to the north of us. So that, that, extra, that seven feet is not really creating any buffer in relationship to the neighbor next to it. And on the south side, we are requesting a reduction of uh, a foot. Three feet. On the south side, there's a request for a reduction of three feet. feet. It's four feet is proposed and seven feet is required. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's true. Sorry. I misspoke on that. Okay. How about this? Planning Commission finds that with changes discussed in the Commission meeting to the design of the parking lot, the landscaping requirement uh, within the parking area will um, enhance the addition, the um, enhance the entrance to the mid block walkway. Period, and that the. Um, what do you call them? Setbacks, the landscape setbacks um, adjacent to properties um, that there that there are um, property the properties on both sides have landscaping, and that given the design, it is appropriately buffered from adjacent uses. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For staff, just to make sure I understand your position, right? Your your position is that if we approve this project with your conditions, mm -hmm. and I'm just essentially removing those two parking spots, will then create enough landscaping to satisfy the landscaping requirement because that's they're not connected. The exactly, spaces right? in front of the mid block weren't connected to right. our finding on the parking lot landscaping. Those that was connected to visibility of the public art which is proposed in the middle of the walkway yep. as well as for ease of access of pedestrians to that area. Um, which of your conditions helps address the landscaping issue? We're recommending denying on denying the landscaping right. issue. So there wasn't a condition of approval associated with it because in staff's uh, opinion, the project okay. would just be better if they provided the required landscaping. And how many parking spots do we lose with denying the landscaping requirement? We lose four. 
I think it's important to note that on page 69 of the Salt Lake design element, published, I think, in 19, or adopted in 1999, pardon me, it states that a landscape buffer uh, is meant to mitigate the negative impact of neighboring sites. And the important thing to notice here is that our neighboring site is a parking lot to the north, and our neighboring site is a warehouse to the south. So we think that there's nothing to mitigate the negative impacts from parking lot to parking lot, which is what drove our request for the reduction in the first place. Um, I would just add that the intent for a parking lot landscaping requirements in that zone um, states that these requirements are specifically meant for multifamily uses and residential uses as opposed to non-residential uses. So that it's and the importance is placed space, on that. Blacktop space, all that. Space. Yeah. I I have mixed feelings about the this, a lot of some of the stuff. I mean, I actually like the project in a lot of different ways, and I'm I guess I'm mixed because I feel like the Gateway District has so is a really cool spot um, and could really become this really urban feel. Although maybe it's moving to the greenery. That's kind of where more of that development's happening now. Um, and Gateway's kind of struggle. But the original vision for Gateway was to be this kind of urban, very lively, walkable community. Um, and I actually really like the work that these guys tend to do. I think they are be some of the better mid-level projects. Um, and I, you know, and I feel though, you know, we're kind of like, I don't know. I just feel like this feels like a weird project to put. It doesn't fit like originally what Gateway was envisioned. Now, all that said, like given its context, where it's located between the train tracks and the railroads, is not like a lot that's really happening to the west or north of the project, and some of these sort of values of a walkable, lively, may or may not apply. Because I'm, I'm tempted not to, I, not to approve the landscape I and mean, follow most of staff's recommendations. Um, but I'm also like torn about it. I don't know how much I, so I've said my piece, we can move on. Just as a matter of process, do we have a complete motion that's been no. made? I don't I'm, believe it is. Okay, so are, are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I completed the motion. Okay. I was Adrian here. Okay. It, it wasn't, we were trying to work through the standards and, and the alternate findings and the standards. And I, it's the alternate finding was that the plan, I said, the planning, com okay. the planning commission. I have to write this down I and know. say it at the same time. <laughs> As the law says we have to come up with findings. So I it's guess just, we did. We have, we have the sir. finding. All right. We have the finding. I don't know um, that we had a second. We don't have a second. Don't yet. have a second. Do you need a second of finding? No, we didn't. We, we didn't have a <laughs> we, second on the, didn't have on a the second entire on the motion. motion. I second the motion. Okay. Brenda made the motion in all its convolutions, and Adrian seconded it. Do we have any more discussion? Are we ready to vote? Do we know what we're voting on? Is everybody comfortable with that? <laughs> okay. We'll vote. Can I, can I just make one comment before we do that? Um, the, um, the applicant is required to provide 497 square feet of interior parking lot landscaping. If they do as I suggested on that, just that one part, uh, uh, excuse me, and they provide 380, um, uh, which is 117 square feet of difference. If they do what I just asked them to do in moving the parking spaces in, they will have 192 extra spaces. So we do not need to forgive them for, the par for their landscaping. We don't need to have a finding with, on that at all. Those, yeah, we do have to do something about the uh, buffer air, perimeter landscape, though. We have to have a finding on that. And maybe we could just say, since they provided so much extra landscaping in their parking lot. Are you going to amend your motion to say that, please? I think we had a complete my attorney finding doing? before. We had a complete <laughs> finding. Because the that. finding was about the parking lot landscape 
requirements. Right. And do you, oh. had, a, you had a finding for that? I did. So are you amending we, your own motion? So, or were you just trying to explain it? No, I was just saying that you don't actually need, you can deny them, we can use the same language on number, sorry. Um, maybe, if, I'm, if I may, I don't know if this will help or not, it might be more complicated, but can I offer a substitute motion? Yes, please do. So I'm gonna split the landscape reductions and then the rest of it apart real quick. I think that's one way to move at least part of that forward. Um, so staff recommends planning commission approve, uh, wait, no, based on the findings listed in the staff report and the planning uh, staff recommendations, the planning commission approve Conditional building and site design review uh, for the requested modifications at GM U urban design provisions related to the exterior material requirements. This recommendation is based on conditions of approval listed below uh, with the following recommend changes. Uh, number one, that the accessible portion of the parking stall is moved in front of the mid block walkway to provide a visual connection from 100 South back through the mid block. Uh, Two, three, and four, or two, accepted as written? three, and four, yeah, accepted as written. Five, the gas meters will be appropriately screened with landscaping uh, and meet all code requirements. And then uh, six, that the architectural detailing uh, meet the drawings provided by the applicant during the uh, presentation today. And seven and eight as written. And that motion is with respect to both petition numbers. Yes. Yes. Can you state the plan development? This motion does not address the landscaping lot requirements. Not yet, for, to clarify. I don't know, I state both of them. And this motion is related to, you want me to state both the petitions? Just state both petitions for the record. Sure. Um, Petition PLN SUB 2019-128 and PLN PCM 2019-129. No, we have a second I'll on second the that. substitute. Second on the, who's, who, who uh, second? Yeah, I second. Okay, it. Weston, okay. So we're just being silent as to the requested landscape reduction on I'll the interior? I'll do another motion here. You're going to do a second motion on that? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we'll get, I'll try to get a second one through. Are you willing to accept the substitute yes. motion and the, and the second? Okay. That's not necessary by your rules of process. The substitute okay. motion prevails at the time. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So are we ready to vote on what Matt has presented? Okay. Adrian. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Weston. Yes. Amy. Yes. Matt. Yes. Thank you. So and second, you have a second motion. Which we'll, we'll see where people land on this one. But based on the findings listed in the staff report, um, uh, planning staff recommends, or the planning commission approve, I uh, know. So based on the analysis and findings in the staff report and the discussion and testimony submitted today, I move that the planning commission deny the reductions for parking lot landscaping requirement requests by the applicant. A second. Can I? You can, well, if there's no second, you can substitute it. You can substitute. Substitute. Based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, I move that the Planning Commission approve the plan development request PLN SUB 2019-00128 for new construction in the GMU zoning district, deny the request re reductions to parking lot landscape requirements, and approve the reduction in the 
I don't think you want to deny you want to accept the requested reductions of the parking lot landscape requirements with conditions or with a finding that. Yeah, you're 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 thinking deny, but you want to deny the you you want to staff you don't request. Want, no, yeah. Take a deep breath. So let me tell you what I want to do, and then we can figure out the words to do it, which is that I, I don't think we need to speak to parking lot landscape. Well, the, the, we're, not, we're denying them the parking lot landscaping reduction because they don't need it. And number two, what about the side yard setback reduction or side yard landscaping? Is that part of the parking lot landscaping? It's, separate. it's a separate issue, right? We're not talking about the side yard stuff at all. We're just talking about the perimeter landscape requirements for okay. interior parking lot. Perimeter and interior landscape requirements for a parking lot, right? Yeah. So we are, um, we are. So you want to? I want to let them off the hook on can the perimeter. You, and you want, if I can help you, you want the planning commission to approve the plan development request to reduce the parking lot landscape requirements based on the finding of, now fill in that blank, what is your finding about, you said it earlier, you and Adrian. Change, Reduction the is changes no longer to the necessary. Design, the changes of the I, design no, to the park. Nope, 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 nope. Because nope. the only thing we're, we're saying might be okay is the perimeter landscaping reduction. But, it, it, but they're tied. But they're tied together? But it's, it's perimeter and interior parking lot landscaping. And then separately is perimeter site landscaping buffering. And we've already addressed the perimeter site landscaping requirements through our first motion, I think all we're dealing with right now is what to do with of the, the, interior, the parking. interior parking, landscaping, the requested reduction, and staff's recommendation to deny the re requested reduction. Right. So we are denying the requested reductions to the interior parking lot landscaping requirements. That was my motion. No, you're, you're saying that if you... you... You disagree with me, I think. I'm not positive, but I think you do. Because you want to allow, you want them to have the reduced landscaping, correct? Well, she's no, she doesn't she's think saying it's, it's not necessary if you redesign the parking lot if, as discussed. With the consolidation, does it have to be does it have to be conditioned on the reconfiguration of the parking lot? I think you need to accept the reduction only because that was the recommended staff position. Okay, and then. But then you stipulate the reason why is because they're already meeting with reconsolidating. Well, I, don't, I don't have to do any stipulations if I just read it the way the staff wrote it. Okay, then, then the other option, I think what you're trying to say is that you approve... Um, you, you deny the requested reductions to the parking lot or you can approve the requested reductions to the parking lot landscape requirements with the following conditions, that the parking lot is redesigned per the discussion of the planning commission, and I, I don't remember all the details that's of how a, you reconfigured but that's it. But that's not a, um, a finding. Well, then you can make a finding. So the finding is gonna be tied to the plan development standards. I think they're still losing parking spots. Um, e even even if they're moving those things to to the center and making a more direct line with the with the accessible lot, they're still going to lose. No, oh, it just shifts in. They're not. I promise you, they will not lose parking spots. If you guys don't approve the landscaping reduction, we will lose parking stalls. If we squeeze the parking the way Commissioner Shear suggested, we won't lose any stalls and we'll pick up an additional 300 some odd feet of landscaping. So I think maybe the move is to approve it with the conditions of squeezing the parking per Commissioner Shear's suggestions and planning commission. 
So I'm curious, Molly, is would stating that reconfiguring the, the parking configurations and consolidating landscaping equal a finding? To me to, that, that's that's really that's standard. That's what you're allowing. The standard is is one of these the plan development standards that <clears throat> the purposes of. But they can meet the standard right. if they reconfigure the parking. Under under this under this current things that we've been talking about, they still cannot meet the perimeter landscaping perimeter requirements. Part. Okay. They still will not meet those. But they will be closer. Um, the perimeter is not changing at all, the way they've drawn it. There's, there's two standards. There's the interior parking lot landscaping and the perimeter. No, no, no. We have to, that part, what we have to do also, you see here, we have, it's, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be seven feet and it's only four foot one. That's one of the things that we are. Okay. That we are. That we have. Does everybody understand this? I understand. Okay. I, I, Help my, me the, out here. Well, then. the thing that I'm struggling with, however, is, I, I it's. From my understanding, a finding would come from your interpretation of the standard, and when you were talking about numbers here, it's hard to have a different interpretation of the standard there's not i don't i don't feel like there's a lot of leeway in what the standard has there i mean it's for a perimeter parking lot it's it must be seven feet as measured from the back of the lot of the curb got to have one shade tree for every 30 feet one shrub for three feet so i don't know i don't know how we argue that the either. standard's been met there's not a lot of leeway to do that is so that the purpose of the plan development is to provide relief from that that requirement and maybe it just I don't know if it would help but there is no requirement okay. for landscape from site landscape so what is required for parking is uh, around 450 square feet uh, overall site we're providing uh, close to 5,000 so what we're trying to argue is that what we're providing is uh, is even better than what is requested by the zoning ordinance. And then you guys could agree or not, but I think that's. I just want to add to what he was saying. The parking lot landscaping is separate from the landscaping that's required for the whole site. And he, right. I think in that statement, he bulked those together, not to confuse everyone even more, but they're, they are two different things mm -hmm. and two different requirements. It's required for the site itself, the landscaping on the site. So they're in that requirement of the conditional building and site design that I think it's like 10 square feet for every square foot of area or something like that. Yeah, and? Um, I have the exact calculation in the report. Thank you. Just a minute. Um, and staff stated that we felt they were meeting the intent of that even though they don't meet the overall landscape requirement in terms of numbers because of the close proximity of other um, of other open space areas. Oh, I see. So they don't make that either. But you let them off the hook on that. So the over, if, if they were held to that strict standard, it would be 6,600 square feet of public space due to the amount of um, building floor area. So that applies to building, um, that applies to developments that are over I think it's 60,000 square feet yeah that's right a gross floor area of 60,000 square feet so they're close. in terms of the overall landscaping yes in terms of parking lot landscaping no well in parking lot landscaping there are 117 square feet off that's really not very much either so that's for the, the size of a very small office for the interior parking lot landscaping, um, they're required 497 square feet, and they are proposing 380 feet. For the perimeter, they are required 874, and they are proposing 506. So it's more than just 100, give or take. So given that their adjacent uses are surface parking lots, 
I find that the reduction in perimeter landscaping um, does meet the requirements of the code and satisfies the intent of the ordinance to lessen the impact of parking on adjacent uses. And given the proposed redesign of the interior parking lot, I find that the uh, proposed landscaping as modified per the discussion here would be appropriate for the scale of the development that the applicant is intending. We just changed that to we find? We, we <laughs> collectively. It, is that a motion? No, that's a finding. That's a finding. That's a finding. Yeah, so can there's you make my that finding. Into a motion? Um, I can motion that we approve. I make a motion based on the finding you just said. Based on the, my findings and the information presented and the input received during the public hearing that <clears throat> the Planning Commission approved the requested reductions to parking lot landscaping subject to um, the applicant redesigning the parking lot and landscaped areas per the input received during the hearing. The second? I will second that. Brenda seconds. Any discussion? Okay, let's vote. Adrian? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. Weston? Yes. Amy? Yes. Matt? No. One, two, three, four, five to one. I I'm think aware. it passes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I think Thank you guys very much for your time tonight. Sorry about all the confusion. Seven damn Vacation. Okay, we'll move on here. Item three, the Fern Subdivision Alley vacation at approximately 1019 East Logan Avenue. Um, Anna. So I'm not quite sure how to get this up on the, the screen, so. I uh, have a slideshow. We have it all here, but I guess the public needs to see it too. Oh, damn. Hold on. Hold on. So this application is um, it's PLM PCM 2018-00468. It's for the Fern Subdivision Alley Vacation. It's an alley or it's an alley that is located around 1600 South, in between Wood Avenue and Logan Avenue, and in between 1000 East and 1100 East. Um, the reason for the request is that basically the alley no longer exists there, and um, I do have uh, um, all but two of the adjacent applicant signatures, and that was part of the application. 
And that's also in your staff reports. Um, this is the this is basically the conditions that are there right now. As you can see, um, most of the alley has been incorporated as backyards or as, um, you know, like driveways and that type of stuff. There's a lot of encroachments with fences, a couple of um, like uh, detached garages or, or accessory buildings and that type of thing. So just to kind of clarify, that's where that alley's supposed to be right there. So it's in between 1019 East and 1053 East Logan. And then this is just kind of clarifying, this is um, our map layer, our geocortex layer that shows um, the buildings that um, are on each subject property. And as you can see, some of them may or potentially do encroach into um, the public right-of-way. Um, this is also the original um, subdivision from 1906. And as you can see, it's all the addresses between 1019 East and 1053 East Logan Avenue. And... Um, and then uh, the addresses between 10, or I'm sorry, 1595 and 1615 South, 1000 East. Um, the northern, most northern western arm of that alley has already been vacated. That was vacated in uh, 2000, so it's no longer, it's not part of this um, alley vacate. So proceeding from there, um, this is, the uh, applicant's driveway, um, basically her driveway is the west arm of the alley. And um, this portion of it would technically, the way we would subdivide it is that we, um, the, the, uh, the alley goes, um, it gets divided half and half with their neighbor on 1615 and then her and then with her with 1019 East Logan Avenue. So, um, and uh, her portion of that arm is only the lower, uh, lower half of that alley or the southern half of that alley. The northern half of that alley is the neighbor's uh, backyard at 1095 and 1097. This is um, the alley in between 1053 and 1059 East Logan Avenue. Um, there's also a utility um, that goes through it, I guess a gas utility that goes through that that would need to be addressed either by easement or by having the neighbor at 1059 East Logan um, get some of that alleyway. Um, so that's another issue. There, this is going to need to be... Um, this is going to be need to be um, surveyed to figure out where exactly everything is, for sure. Um, whoops. And this is just basically showing that alley, the north arm of that alley, where you can just see it's just fences and um, possible accessory buildings and that type of stuff. So it's just not even there. So, so, can I ask a quick question? Uh, sure. Would doing the survey to confirm what utilities are in there and ensuring not that really they, what that utilities are in there, but like what, um, like according to if you look at the first um, aerial, you can kind of see possible um, the house at 1059 could potentially be in the alley itself. Um, and then Talking there's about there's yeah. a gas line. Yeah, and there's a gas line in it was the alley. Part of a condition of the vacation to confirm the location of that gas line and to, to ensure that there's an appropriate easement granted to the. Yes, okay. correct. Uh huh. Also, who would be responsible for <clears throat> getting that survey done? Um, it would be the property owner. Property owner. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.
So we're going to um, our standards for alley vacate. So, uh, the, it's lack of use, public safety, urban design, and community purpose. Um, we're going to base it on lack of use because there's basically no alley there. It could also um, meet some of the other requirements as well. So staff is recommending a positive. Staff is recommends that the planning commission forwards a, po a positive recommendation to the city council for the Fern subdivision alley vacation. So, okay. Any more questions for Anna? No. Is the applicant here? Do they want to speak? So state your name for the record, and you'll have um, ten minutes if you need it. <laughs> I want. I don't think I'll need it. My name is Kathleen Bratcher. I live at 1019 East Logan Avenue. We are asking to vacate this alley. Um, um, because we would like to replace our fence, we would like to put in a proper driveway, and um, and, um, and that's pretty much it. I know it seems like this has been really complex, and ours is so easy, so I have nothing else to add. Oh, don't worry, we can make it complex. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Are there any questions yeah, for I the do. applicant? I do, because okay. okay. we're masters at making it complex. So in one of your letters to Anna, you had mentioned that you know, surveying the rest of the alley was cost prohibited, and because one of your neighbors was concerned about maybe having to move their garage. Um, so I'm generally opposed to alley vacations, okay. but you know, you're not responsible for encroachments onto public way when you inherit them. Um, I'm wondering then how are you, because so there's the rule of the subdivision. So this alley vacation, the, what's behind would go to just those houses that are that it designated the Fern subdivision and your house is not in that subdivision, correct? No, that, that's incorrect. Our house is uh, the western part of the Fern subdivision. What's the, your, what, remind me your... I, I live on 1019 East Logan Avenue. Okay, and the all right, then I'm... The so. gentleman who did have an issue, his, his name uh, is Josh and he lives on Wood Street. He's actually not part of the Fern subdivision. Okay, that's good. Okay. That's very helpful. So... In, in vacating this alley, those who fall within the Fern subdivision would be responsible for doing a survey to then identify the appropriate Well, each, new each property landowner line? is responsible to find out whether or not they have encroachments in the alleyway or on anybody else's property. Well, That's then just how, how does the city handle um, selling this to the the property owner if you don't? Uh, so what we would do is give that um, basically our rights to the property owners who are in the Fern subdivision, because that's how um, past law has, has uh, um, handled these situations. It was always so. my understanding that when we do an alley vacation, we're actually selling that land to the property owner. Is that it, not correct it's, now? It's a little bit uh, complicated, and the council has adopted uh, policies with respect to alley vacations. If the alley is adjacent to residential property, then um, they do not require payment. If it's adjacent to non-residential, they do. Oh, although we will be responsible for, for paying property tax on that. So that's something that um, will be incurred by the property owners. So, yeah, this is nothing on you, Kathleen. This is an education, too, as things change from one thing to another. So if they don't do a survey, if the property owner doesn't do a survey, then how does, the, how does it get recorded? So, so my understanding know? is that the city uh, real estate office just does a quick claim deed. Um, and that gets recorded with the ordinance vacating so like the whole that whole public alleyway would then revert to the fern subdivision and nothing with the wood avenue correct and so if they wanted if they felt like someone on wood avenue was encroaching into her then be after, after the, the city, city is now there right after the city quit claims their interest in that portion then the adjacent property owners could do their own, do their own got uh, it. okay thank you adjustments thanks Anyone else have questions? No? So um, we'll have you guys step back, and we'll open the public hearing on this item. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who wants to speak on this item? Come up to the table, state your name into the microphone, and you'll have two minutes. Alan Bloom, uh, 1053 Logan. When I moved into my home, I wasn't aware there was an alley there. In fact, I had a garage built on the area that is part of the alley, and I came to the planning and zoning and got a permit to do so. And they didn't even look at it. I was never told an alley existed until oh, maybe 10 years back. And by then it was too late. There was already a building there. So uh, looking at spilt milk now, you basically really have to give it back to the property owners the way it is tax them or whatever you're going to do, but it, it doesn't exist anymore. So that's my feeling on it. That's okay. all. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. I'll bring it back up to the Planning Commission. Um, any discussion? Do you need staff again? Somebody make a motion. I'll make a motion. Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony, and discussion of the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission transmit a positive recommendation to the City Council for the Fern Subdivision Alley Vacation File PLN PCM 2018-00468 for the reasons listed in the staff report. A second. Brenda seconds. Any discussion? Okay, let's vote. Matt. Yes. Amy. Yes. Weston. Yes. Carolyn. I agree. Brenda. Yes. Adrian. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. So you still you still have to go to the city council. Okay. <laughs> I just had to give you a little. <laughs> um, I knew it was coming. <laughs> we'll move on to the next item, the Sugar Alley Conditional Building and Site Design Review at approximately 2188 South Highland Drive. Would you, would you take your conversation out in the hall, please? Sir, sir, would you take your conversation out in the hall, please? Thank you. Hi, Daniel. All right, hi. <clears throat> All right, so this is a conditional building and site design review request for property at 2188 South Highland Drive. Um, it's a design review request for an eight story, 85 foot tall, approximately, uh, mixed use building with ground floor retail and residential on the upper levels. Um, buildings over 50 feet in the Sugar House zone, um, one zone, uh, require the CBSDR, conditional building and site design review process. So that's what triggered them um, into this process. Um, as part of the conditional building and site design review, uh, we look at the conditional building and site design standards, um, the Sugar House Business District Design Guidelines Handbook, and the Sugar House Circulation and Amenities Plan. Um, as part of this CBSDR, um, they are requesting modification to step backs on Highland Drive on the facade, and I'll get to those in a couple slides. And just up front, staff is recommending approval um, with some conditions. So just quickly, this is a site um, view of the property. Um, you can see it's between the Sugarmont development and the view development on Highland Drive. Um, the arrows in white are showing a shared driveway that the Sugarmont, this development, and the view will be using. Um, and you can see those in the site plans. Um, that driveway is almost complete. So as part of the CBSDR review, um, most of the standards are related to pedestrian orientation, architectural visual interest. Um, generally, we found that the building meets the standards of review. Um, it has a high level of ground level engagement for pedestrians. Um, it also uses high quality building materials, has shadow and depth on the facade, and has high level of transparency that provides even more visual interest. Um, as part of the review, again, we also look at the 
CDH Sugar House Business District design guidelines. Um, those generally have to do with building, ground floor engagement, streetscape improvements. There's actually 115 different guidelines. Um, we found that generally the, um, the ones that are applicable to this project, um, they were meeting. Um, also, we looked at the circulation amenities plan that deals with streetscape improvements and circulation um, improvements, um, such as alleys um, and driveways that break up some of the blocks in Sugar House. And we also found that they meet, met those as well. <clears throat> so these are the requested modifications that the um, developer is looking for. Um, they requested a zero foot step back on the upper level of um, the north east portion of the building that's highlighted in yellow on the right side. Um, generally, staff is supportive of, of this modification as it will draw people's attention um, that are walking down Highland Drive um, down into the alley. Um, also, the developer is asking for modifications on the uh, southeast end of the building, on the left-hand side, um, and that is solely due to fire code constraints. Um, fire code requires that a building be not more than 30 feet from a fire lane, and in this case, Highland Drive is considered the fire lane. Um, so at the bottom level of the building, it's within 30 feet of the fire lane, but the upper portions are stepped back five feet beyond 30 feet measured from the edge of Highland Drive. Um, so fire code would require that they move their building slightly closer to the street on those upper portions, reducing the step back to about 10 feet. And staff is supportive of that recommendation of, of that um, because it is a code constraint and because they are still putting in a step back, still generally meets the intent um, of that code requirement. So with that, re uh, we are recommending approval with conditions. Um, generally, uh, the first condition has to do with final streetscape, landscape, sign details be delegated to staff. Um, that includes um, a wayfinding sign requirement um, as the Sugar House Business District design guidelines generally call for a wayfinding. Go ahead. So, question on that, Daniel. So, huh? the um, on the wayfinding, um, the site design guidelines um, are specifying like new design instead of the like mob thing we have now. They don't call for a particular sign design in particular. Maybe this was my memory so, of like what we wanted to achieve was something a new different. look. So, does it? So the way you interpret it is it's just like any sign. There's no, it doesn't have to be continuity between anything else going on. There, there's, not a yeah, there's not a requirement that it matches the other developer signs. Um, they're free to design something that meets their, their site. Yeah. Um, the other second condition has to do with the step back approval um, on the southeast portion of the building as the final step dimensions are going to depend on fire code's final decision on that. And the third one has to do with alleyway improvements within the adjacent property owner. It's just a standard call out that any improvements on the adjacent property owner um, are subject to that owner's approval. Um, so with that, um, I can take any questions and I'll generally leave it to the applicant to, to present so their I actual designs. I have questions. Design. If you want to go back go to the rendering of an aerial, <laughs> and, and I think sometimes renderings are make it odd for me to like figure out what's going on on the ground. Is Sugar Alley, the new road connecting Elm to Wilmington? No. So there Where is that coming in this? So you can see the shared driveway is called I know, out so I want to know where is, where is the new road that's being built that's on connecting Wilmington? That is the shared driveway that's, that's called out with the, the arrow on the, the on the left side, the very south the end. Of the that's not Sugarmont? No, it's not. It's We're a, fitting it's all of that in between. I think... The developer has a, a better site plan in their PowerPoint that they can, they can <laughs> go over okay. that with you. And then so setback so that because the, the new road and then also the alleyway, it's, it wouldn't, for Sugar House, you wouldn't put a 15-foot setbacks on those? No. Because they're private areas or? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because they're private, it doesn't And the apply. city does not have easements over either one of those? No. We have uh, an agreement that um, one of them will serve as a fire access for the Sugarmont um, with the fire department, but that's it. Because originally we, and I think, I mean, the site has changed since I think the first time was that hospital idea and then the right. other right. people were like, hey, I'll take you and they moved him up. Um, but 
originally the idea was to have like the street kind of flow through and then flow through that kind of arcway on that building. Do you feel like this site plan still is accomplishing that goal that they were we were doing when we were here last time? Yes, and it actually completely reflects what was approved under that prior approval. And in fact, that driveway is about finished um, as, as well as the plaza space and landscaping that was a part of that. Um, thanks. Any more questions for no, Daniel? Actually, I do. So you're calling that a driveway, which I call it a road, reconnecting Elm and Wilmington. And um, refresh my memory, because it's private, um, but yet it's going to be open to the public, is there an easement that's being recorded on there or has been or will be? Or can they just shut that down if they feel like it? The two property owners, if they work together. They, they could shut it down. but Well, technically, they can't shut it down because it is required for fire access. It has to be open for any fire truck to come in, do it in a, during an emergency. So they couldn't shut that driveway down. And what's the, what's the process if you're doing a private road that it... I mean, is, is there a legal process and that it becomes like a public road but privately done? Or are those always considered driveways? You could consider a driveway or a private street. It's it's a private thoroughfare. Um, it, it, I guess it doesn't make a difference as far as this review goes. Um, I know. I mean, but, you're just educating. Uh, yeah. Me about it, so. it, it, the, all of the property owners involved in this um, have an agreement and an easement um, relating to this that establishes the right that's of That's really what I was wondering about. So there is an easement agreement, and I couldn't remember that. Yes. So that's fine. Thanks. And on Sugarmont, didn't we require that passageway to be generally open during certain times or whatever? Didn't we re to cross through? Wasn't there a condition of approval on that one? I can't remember if there was. I'm, I'm sorry. I was positive there was, but we've also had other similar projects. Okay. Anything else? Okay, why don't we get the applicant up here? Gentlemen, be sure to introduce yourselves for the record, <laughs> and you'll have 10 minutes, but I'm sure there'll be questions afterwards. <laughs> uh, Daniel, thank you for your time and for uh, working through this project with us. Um, obviously, it's a, a good-sized project in uh, the heart of Sugar House, um, so we're excited to be here uh, talking to everybody about this. Um, but just by way of introduction, my name is Ben Lowe with Lowe Property Group, uh, and Lowe Property Group, uh, in combination with Eight Bay Advisors, are the uh, the developers of, of the site. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. And I'm Alex Lowe with uh, Lowe Property Group. Uh, Peter Burr with MVM Partners with Architect. Uh, so we'll be quick. Um, in fact, I'll scoot over here so I can uh, click. Uh, but we spent a lot of time with the community council and have really appreciated their input on this on this site. We've been through literally every one of the Sugar House uh, design guidelines and have really worked hard to incorporate those. And we're really excited about where we've ended up um, on this uh, on this particular project. Um, as you know, and and I'll, I'll talk a little about the road and I think answer some of the questions you have here as I, as I move through quickly. Um, but we're uh, we're. Uh, excited about a lot of the things that really I think fit what Sugar House is looking for and what design guidelines are asking for. So just, you know, high level, um, we're uh, looking at 17,000, over 17,000 square feet of, of retail space uh, on this building um, and 186 uh, apartment units, a uh, total of eight stories uh, on the building. Um, Going to kind of move through quickly. So we wanted to highlight a few things that really I think the Sugar House guidelines call for. One of them is related to connectivity. Um, so uh, how we're connecting different spaces in the community. Uh, we think this site is an important site for the connectivity in Sugar House because we've got the S line in Fairmont Park to the west. And in fact, uh, at Sugarmont, there was a requirement that there be basically a gap in their building to, to provide access to that. Uh, we felt like what we were doing here was important to provide that same connectivity so you could get out Highland Drive and, and go east. 
So you see the areas in yellow, and these are all um, spaces that create this connectivity. Obviously, on the bottom, you have the, the roadway that, that will be open to the public. We have the drives into the building. Uh, you know, through, there's, there's a number of drives off of that road that into our building as well as into Sugarmont's building. So it needs to be open for residents to even get into their, uh, uh, into the garage. And, and as was mentioned, we have easements with the other adjacent property owners, so we, we can't close that. Um, so that's obviously one passage of, of uh, where people can come and there's a sidewalk along there. But I think on the other side, we're even more excited about uh, Sugar Alley, uh, which we're calling it right now. There's a, a, a road that's kind of falling apart uh, running up that. And so we've proposed to close that off and make it a true pedestrian retail type of street. Right now, the view, our neighboring partner has retail all along its building that's struggling quite a bit because it's set back off of Highland Drive. We think if we match the retail on the other side, and put pavers down it and make it a, a, a world-class experience, um, it's going to make it a, a spot that can draw. And along with that, it provides connectivity. And the city has a, a hawk light planned uh, basically to cross the street to the Whole Foods that would, would, would match up with this alley. So it kind of fits perfectly with kind of the pedestrian access. So I want to interrupt you while we're in that space. Um, how is somebody going to access from the new driveway coming from McClelland to the underground parking of the view that's located like right adjacent to the paw by paw uh, dog store? So they have the underground. So they have like their, their connection to the Paseo, which somebody almost ran me over the other day as I was walking my dog um, and then realized it wasn't a through street and yeah. backed all the way out. But there is that underground parking access via that um, Sugar Alley. How are they going? How are you directing to maintain that access into their views underground parking at that juncture? If you see where the arrow is, that says McClellan Street, right above no. that is the access. <laughs> oh, that area. Yeah, on the yeah on the kind of top left, um, there's that the big right. arrow. Right, that's the one I'm talking. So that's about. the access. So that is still that is on the road that we have now built. So it, it has direct access to the road. So now you'll just you'll now you'll come down Wilmington. If you're coming from Highland, you'll come down Wilmington, turn right, and you can go in there. But that road also connects out to McClellan Street, so you can just come into McClellan Street the same way you do right now. So are you going to be um, connecting to the which is now just like regular concrete? So if we've got the road that's falling apart, and you're going to take that out. Are you going to be working with the owner of the view to make that whole area something, a different material that's like this is, you know, for pedestrians? Cause yes, that's our intent. Um, we've gotten verbal confirmation from the neighbor that they want to do this, so they're excited about it. We flew out and met with them, and uh, they're excited about it, obviously, until they sign the dotted line, um, you know, and we're, we're doing it. We don't know for sure, but that's, that's our plan and what we're, what we're planning. And okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, anyway, on the west side also of that street, we also have plaza area on the, on the west side up next to um, Sugarmont's property. There's a, a 20 foot wide plaza along there that we just want to highlight. Um, uh, so here's just a couple of shots of what we intend that alley to look like. Um, so this gives a little bit of feel. These are uh, renderings based on the construction drawings. So we think we really have the opportunity to create a, a world class pedestrian street and, and access. Um, I'm going to kind of keep moving through here because I know uh, time is tight. Uh, one of the focal points of this project uh, is on Highland Drive, we're creating a, a glass atrium. Um, in the uh, Sugar House uh, community guideline, design guidelines, um, it, it, it calls for creating plaza space uh, by shaping the surrounding buildings to the social space. And that's often done with kind of open uh, outdoor plazas, which we have a lot of. But we're also creating what we think is a very special space in a glass atrium uh, that where we can plant trees inside and those grow and are green year round. And we have sunlight coming in. We have retailers planned on each side of the atrium. So those retailers can spill in. And it's intended to be open to the public during the business hours of the retailers. So the whole community can come enjoy it. And it becomes a plaza space that actually is uh, warm and inviting year round instead of for just a few months of the year. Um, so we're really excited about, uh, about that particular feature. Um, obviously, we've talked about the retail. Uh, we have over 17,000 square feet of retail. Um, obviously, all along Highland Drive, it's, it's either retail or the atrium that's open to the public. Um, or along uh, Sugar Alley, we also have, uh, have retail. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that retail space. Um, and there's outdoor seating along, along all of that retail as well. How much square footage is along Sugar Alley? Um, 
Uh, of retail, you said. Oh, of the retail, how much of it is along Sugar Alley? Oh, God, it's probably about half, Peter. It's about six and change um, along. Overall, I think we're about 17. Yeah. 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 yeah it's like 6,500. 6,500, yeah. Oh, that's, that's what, okay. So I have a question about that setback on um, the Sugar Alley section. Does, does the ordinance, um, is the setback requirement only for the Highland Drive and not for anything along Sugar Alley? So you're just asking for relief from that Highland Drive, and then there's nothing that says you need a setback along Sugar Alley? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and as I jump to the next slide, um, I mean, I'll let Peter, Todd, Peter was nice enough to fly into town uh, for, for this. Uh, and Peter was the, I guess, the mastermind, the architect behind all this. But I'll let him speak on the design. Yeah, I think overall, you know, just being in Sugar House, it's obviously this draw towards brick architecture. So what we try to do here is introduce brick architecture that really speaks to some of the traditional components of what brick is, and then also speak to some of the modern components of what brick can do. So we're, we're shying away from going just to your pure, pure red brick approach, but uh, you know, introducing full dimensional brick on the first two levels close to the pedestrian so you can get really rich detailing in that pedestrian and retail experience. And then as you move up the building, going to a lighter, more white brick um, kind of mixture that uh, is a more of a thin brick application, but um, just keeps the building lighter and, and, um, and more contemporary up above. But uh, I think one of the exciting things about this project is just, we, yes, we are activating the ground floor with retail, but we're doing it in several different fashions. Um, Sugar Alley is gonna have a really special kind of moment, like um, Amy, you were mentioning. We will be doing enhanced pavers in there is kind of the intent and really playing that up as what was initially looked at as almost kind of a B side to the building. It really becomes a feature all of a sudden when we treat it that way. Um, and then uh, like Ben mentioned, the atrium as well, just being an additional unique component um, to really create that activation at the ground level. And so it looks like you're going to have retail on three sides, the driveway, Highland, and Sugar Alley. Is that correct? No, the retail is on two sides, always... Highland and Sugar Alley. Okay, because renderings can always like, make you feel like you're like, seeing something you're not. <laughs> so I wanted to just, so you're not going to have, you'll just have retail on those two, two sides. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. How, um, how wide is Sugar Alley? Is it? 31 feet is that what the yes it's about 30 feet a little over 30 feet um this is our last slide uh but uh just you know the private drive is actually now complete we're just doing punch list items but the the traffic signal the four-way traffic signal is now installed and and working and uh and striped we did uh upgrade it from the original plan just you know to concrete because we just thought it looked nicer in mcclelland on the other side of the street is, is concrete we wanted to continue the nicer look uh we also did the enhanced crosswalk pavers that you can't see in the pictures here but um crossing the alley so we, we you know i think it, it's just speaking to kind of the direction we're planning to take this whole project of a very high-end uh, community. Um, the one other thing I wanted to point out that's not in these slides is just on the request on the relief on the setback on the, uh, I, I guess, northeast corner where, this, where Sugar Alley intersects with Highland Drive. You'll see there, you can see there's a, a plaza area where we're not setting back the building up above. And the reason is, is because we decided to do a ground level plaza there. So while we have the atrium as an indoor public space, we have a, a large plaza on the corner of the building on Highland Drive and Sugar Alley that kind of welcomes people into Sugar Alley. Uh, and it's actually a covered plaza. So what we've done is we've lifted kind of the, the bottom floor of the building up. And so it's covered. So if it's raining, people can be sitting out on that deck there. And originally we had the setback above and the plaza and it was this like wimpy little piece that stuck out in the middle and it was really strange. So rather than setting back up above, we set back down below where the public can use it. And that was really the intent of, uh, of that change. One other comment. Um, the question came up earlier about wayfinding signage um, and having some consistency within the, the, the neighborhood. Um, we've been working with the community council um, on the wayfinding signs and actually proposed sort of some standards of what we could potentially do and have reached out to some of the local developers, including those of the Shopco site, and sent those to them. And so our hope is um, that we would go and, and start implementing that. And we'd love to have something that's actually codified that can be consistent within the, the, the uh, Sugar House. I would just district, suggest so. get away from the mob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you'll see that's, that's definitely, uh, we concur. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Daniel could help us uh, codify a, a standard, you know. <laughs> um, so I just have some comments and, and some like logistical questions. Um, one, I think the ground uh, level of this is infinitely better than any of the other two iterations that came before. 
So kudos to that. It does look so much better. Um, one of the other architectural or just like amenity things that, that seem to define the business, especially the old business district in Sugar House, are the use of those awnings. And so to and you have them on Looks Like Sugar Alley, you have them in the rendering. And I would just really encourage you to um, to incorporate that because it's not only brick. The awnings are, you'll see those if you go on the north side of 21st South, you'll still see all the old awnings. Um, and some of them have been replaced, some of them haven't. But that was another, uh, that's another feel to kind of incorporate into that sugar house design. And, and to add to that, we are actually creating a signage kind of package for the retail right now. And the awnings are actually be a big part of that, um, where the retailers really can express their brand and, and who they are. So, right. And, yeah. and, and so I think that's a great addition. And I, I think allowing the retailers to see, to understand, like, this is where you can put, you know, if you look down, it'll say Sterling Furniture. It's not like you can't see what the place is. We have very strong design guidelines for retailers so that they have to come in and use our lettering above, and then the awnings come, and that's where they, you know, so that it keep, can, keeps it consistent. So, so I like that coloring, making them some colors would be also cool. I mean, that's another, um, it's not so Sugar House isn't just about the brick. Like, there's all these other components to making it feel, but I, I, personally really like the the ground level retail that you've done and I think um, creating that sugar alley that space has always been a vision to make that pedestrian and so I think this is um, really good and I I can see and I can understand the reduction in the setback to create that kind of little covered plaza area and I think that's a, a neat space in addition to what's going to happen there and so um, I personally have, think that that's a good addition design-wise to that, to that location. So my logistic question ugh, is this driveway, are you, are you giving it a name? Is it going to be one at Elm Street or Wilmington Avenue? Or, it are you be, just going to call be, it a driveway? It will be, it will be Wilmington. Wilmington so we'll Avenue? Call, yeah. And so uh, during your construction, is that Wilmington Avenue extension going to be open or is it because where in the heck are you going to stage this? <laughs> uh, yes, it will be open. We need to provide access to our neighboring property owners, and so uh, that's an important thing. Um, so staging is always a challenge uh, on these podium deck buildings. I mean, it, it's it's very common, though. We're building into urban spaces you know, all around the country, and including in Salt Lake, uh, and so it takes a contractor who knows what they're doing. But typically what will happen is you'll build the, the podium deck, and then you'll actually stage on your podium deck, put your crane on your podium deck, and that's where you stage out of is the, is the general intent. But a lot of it is also just in time delivery for a site like this. I mean, that's just kind of the way it works on these urban sites is literally, you know, you bring a truss as you need the truss instead of trying to do a big yard. Um, it's just kind of not the reality in these urban centers. So, so that new Wilmington Avenue section will be open yes. um, as you do this. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Forgive me if this question has already been addressed, but, and I wasn't on the commission when the, your neighboring partner to the south and west was built or approved, but you talked about the, the walkway, the pedestrian way where the, the building is parted for people to walk over to the S line um, to incorporate all that. What's the pedestrian experience to that? Like how do, how do you then encourage people that once they've walked through that pedestrian brig, uh, area to understand where they're at and, and how to get around to the front? Cause there's no, cause you don't have any retail you said on, on your portion of Wilmington. Yeah. It's going to be Wilmington. Correct. Um, so what do they just come to a blank wall? Is there an entrance into the apartments? What what's over on that side? Uh, yeah, so no, that's a good question. Um, so if you're looking at, at you know, just this uh, this slide, for example, so there's a plaza area on the um, west side. So you see where the road curves around and starts to head north. There's about a 20 foot you know, plaza there, and that's the pedestrian experience. So basically what happens is you come down Sugar Alley, we'll have a crosswalk from Sugar Alley to the plaza, and then you walk down the plaza to the opening um, between their building. Um, so the plaza's on the, not on your property, but on the other, the other side of the street? Is that what that? It's on our, that is our property. Our, their, their building comes right to our property, so we built the plaza. Okay. Um, oh, okay. And just that plaza we've landscaped it um and so that is in but uh you know it's a it's a it's a very friendly pedestrian experience at 20 feet away
And I have to give these guys kudos because they've been working with us for probably a year, maybe a year and a half, talking about their various designs, reviewing what had previously been approved, that sort of thing. And as they made changes, they talked to Landon or myself or they came to the Land Use Committee. They've been to the Community Council several times. And I think everybody's very comfortable that this is going to be a really good addition to the heart of Sugar House. As you come down Highland and the street curves, you're going to see that the wall that starts Sugar Alley. And what I can envision from their uh, drawings looks like it's going to be a really inviting place. Right now, we kind of joke that people stop about where he said the hawk light is at Sugar Alley, and they bolt across the street because there's no there there. And I think this will finish that off and make, make it some place that people want to actually walk. And that's what Sugar House is all about, is the walking. They've also done a great job with quality design and uh, the finishes on the building. And they tell us that this will be the classiest place, the classiest apartment building. We'll have to see, because the others that have been built are pretty nice. I'm glad Amy asked the question about uh, staging, because that was one of my concerns, too. I saw the uh, crane for the University Health Building yesterday. That's 15 feet square, a billion feet up, and 100 feet of concrete underneath. So I hope these guys have something strong like that. I can't imagine building like that. Uh, now, you know, you know me well enough to know that I always have to say but. There's always some things I have to stick in here and say I think are missing. Originally, that lot had 75 surface parking stalls. So if you, if you do the math and they have 100 and 86 apartments, 286 parking stalls. That leaves one per apartment and 100 stalls. So we're really not getting any extra retail parking. And they're adding 17,000 square feet, which I'm sure is way more than what we had before. So I'm just pointing that out once again. I think we still have a shortage. We actually have lost three or four small businesses in Sugar House in the last few months because of parking. And I think I'm going to start working on parking as a, a goal, a way to have a good map and people know where, they're, where they can park. Um, we're also increasingly receiving comments about three-bedroom apartments. Nothing is being built with a three-bedroom apartment in the core of Sugar House. So, We'd like to encourage these guys maybe to see if there's a place they can put some of those in here. We have some families that would really like to stay, and they want to be in the urban core, not out in the neighborhoods of Sugar House. We're also dismayed there are no affordable units. Of 1,000 units approved in Sugar House, only 60 are affordable. That's pretty scary. So where are the folks who serve us in the restaurants and the stores supposed to live? Well, right now they live in West Valley and drive in. Um, let's see, we already talked about retail parking. Uh, the sign package that these guys are talking about and Amy asked about is, I think, well on its way. I've talked with most of the developers or the developers have talked with each other and everybody seems to be on the same page that the key thing that will help Buy and Sugar House together are signs. So when you come through that walkway from the streetcar and you're on their little plaza, it's like, where am I? Well, if there's a sign that says Sugar House Park this way or Library this way or Sugar Alley this way, I think if we start to build that, then people will know, like Amy's signs of some years back, 15 minutes to Sugar House Park from this corner and an arrow. So that's the kind of thing we're going to build with that sign package. And I think if we all work together, it'll be pretty cool. Thank you, Judy. I also have a card from Landon Clark.
come up and state your name for the record. And, and you have two minutes. Uh, well, this is intimidating. Uh, my name is Landon Clark, and I'm chair of the Sugar House Community Council. Um, I'm just here to kind of reiterate what Judy Short said about working with these guys and their community engagement. Um, because of the explosion of growth in Sugar House, we have seen our fair share of development, and as a group, we're appreciative when a developer is a pleasure to work with. Uh, these guys reached out early in the process with Judy and me. They have been on to several land use and zoning committee meetings and community council meetings. Uh, they have become active partners in our community events. Uh, most importantly, they have just listened to the community's needs and wants with their addition of retail, plans for street activation, and public space. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who'd like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back up to the commission. Do we want staff and the applicant back? I have one quick question for staff. Okay, when, Dan? When the last project was here for this site, there was this conversation about stepping the row along Highland, and it just hasn't been part of our conversation today. And I don't know if I really remember the details of why we talked about stepping, if it was a design guideline or one of the crazy whims of this body. But um, do you remember that the, at all? The stepping of... I was like, so long Highland, like rather having a straight flat area, mm -hmm. it was like you had it stepped and then it's kind of stepped like that. It was like old I, Sugar House was kind of built that way. I remember, I remember that Yeah, Yeah. I think maybe their first plan was fairly flat and didn't have, incorporate some sort of columns and recess for light, for, for windows. Um, and I think that was part of the conversation then. Okay. It has been a while, but... Anyone else? A motion? I'll make it, because it's not a complicated one, so I'm on board. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve PLN PCM 2019-00264 Sugar Alley Conditional Building and Site Design Review with the conditions listed in the staff report. A second? Second. Second. Who, who was first? Carolyn? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a second from Carolyn. Any discussion? Okay, let's vote. Adrian. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Weston. Yes. Amy. Yes. And Matt. Yes. Okay, you got it unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the Sugar House Business District Design Standards Text Amendment. One second. So this is a city initiated petition um, for changes to the Sugar House Business District Zone. Um, this zone includes the Sugar House Business District 1 Zone and the Sugar House Business District 2 Zone. Um, the primary goals of this are to add additional design standards for these zones and to add additional streetscape standards and additionally to um, impose an additional ground floor use restriction on dwelling units facing 1100 East and 21st South. Um, the intent of this uh, proposal is to bridge the regulation gap between large and small developments. Um, small developments aren't subject to the conditional building and site design review process, um, for example, with the project that you just last saw. Um, so there's very few design standards and zoning standards for those projects. Um, additionally, uh, the, pr the purpose of this was to put requirements up front in the code so developers know um, what the standards are going to be. Um, and just up front again, staff does recommend um, that you forward a positive recommendation for the, um, this proposal. 
Then, so, yep. Can you make sure you're? Oh, projecting? I'm sorry. Let's run up. Thank you. Oh, now we're behind. Okay, so just for context, um, this is the Sugar House Business District Zone. Um, business, business District 1 Zone is in yellow, and that, develop, that allows the development up to 105 feet. Um, the pink areas are the Sugar House Business District 2 Zone, and those allow development up to 60 feet in height. So there's different scales allowed in the Sugar House Business District area. <clears throat> so part of the issue um, that brought this uh, petition forward is that small-scale developments that are under the thresholds established in the Sugar House Business District Zone for conditional building and site design have very few standards that they need to comply with. Um, a developer can just come in and get a, essentially um, do 40% glass, include one entry on their street-facing facade, and um, get a building permit. So there's very few Stand, design standards um, that they'd have to comply with. Whereas with a large scale development, um, they have to go through the whole conditional building site design review process um, with all of its standards. Um, they also have to comply with the design guidelines that are um, the Sugar House Master Plan, um, including the circulation and amenities um, and streetscape amenities plan. Um, and they have to comply with any design, with design standards, which would essentially right now just be 40% glass and an entrance on the facade, street facing facade. You also determined by footprint or by height or by... It is by height and also by square footage. So any building in Sugar House that's over 20,000 square feet in area has to go through this process. Is there a large scale? Yeah. Um, and then for the Sugar House Business District 2 zone, um, anything over uh, 30 feet in height has to go through the process. Regardless of size. Yeah. So it's kind of a combination of two. And then in Sugar House Business District 1 zone, anything over 50 feet in height. Essentially, the square footage ends up triggering the process either way. Um, so part of the point of this proposal is to take those guidelines that are objective in the business district guidelines handbook or subjective standards that could make, be made into somewhat objective standards and put those into the city zoning code as design standards. So the additional design standards that we'd be proposing um, are similar to what's called for in the TSA zones and what is, is currently proposed for the D2 downtown zone. Um, these have to do with ground floor use minimums. So you'd have to have 80% of the facade on a street face would have to have some sort of use on the ground floor. Um, it would have to have a 25 foot depth and the depth provision is to prevent these spaces from just becoming hallways um, or really too small to be usable spaces. Um, we'd also be imposing high quality building material minimums, 80% um, on ground floors. When you, when uh -huh. you say must be a use besides parking. Mm -hmm. Does that mean it has to be retail? No. Um, any, anything be, besides parking. There's an additional restriction. Residential. It could. Currently, it could be. We'd be imposing an additional restriction on residential as part of this proposal. It's a little separate from this design standard itself. So it, it does complicate it a bit. Um, so the high quality building material minimums, 80% ground floor, 60% upper. Um, we'd also be imposing a surface area, surface area screening requirement. So loading docks would have to be screened or behind the building. Um, building entrance spacing. Um, originally we came in in December for a briefing and we had a 30 foot spacing requirement. Um, we ended up going with a 40, 40 foot spacing requirement as it seemed more realistic based on the projects that have been approved in Sugar House. Um, maximum facade length, we'd be imposing a 300 foot standard. Um, in reality, this has been the standard for the past 10 years through the conditional building and site design process. But because the conditional building and site design process is being changed to a design review process, um, that 300 foot requirement has been moved out. Um, so we'd be imposing it through this petition. Um, we'd also be imposing some general design requirements for parking structures that have to do with ground floor uses on um, those uh, facilities and making sure that they have high quality building materials on the outside. So generally all of these requirements are required when a project's going through a design review process. Um, so any large building would have to essentially comply with these. Um, but by putting these into to the 
zoning code itself, um, they'd be required for all buildings, large or small. So the additional key um, proposal in this is a zoning use restriction, and that would be related to ground floor uses. Um, it would restrict the ground floor from being used for dwelling units, individual residential dwelling units. Um, there is a qualifier that live work units would be allowed because they would have a work portion on the ground floor that would help to activate um, the street frontage, um, but it would pro it prohibit just strictly a residential dwelling unit from being on 1100 East Highland Drive or 21st South. How many are currently? Do, do you know? Residential, and I Found think there's only uh, one, um, a recent development. On yeah, there's project, one recent development. One there's one recent development along 2100 South that is yes. residential on the bottom floor. Yes. And there's been no other there's been no other developments on 2100 South. Recently. With residential on the ground floor. No. The one on 10th East. Urbana. Yeah. No, even Urbana has retail on the main floor. So the other component of this are the streetscape standards. Um, so any development would have to install Sugar House style street lighting. Um, they'd have to install wider sidewalks. Um, the requirement would be a minimum of six feet in the Sugar House Business District 2 zone, which is the lower intensity zone, and eight feet in the higher intensity zone. Um, and since the December meeting, we did um, put in some uh, provisions to allow some modifications by the planning director um, if it ultimately complies with the Sugar House circulation um, plan. We're also um, imposing a requirement for uh, brick or pavers to make up 10% of sidewalks. Um, this was brought up by the Sugar House Community Council, and it actually is called for in the circulation plan that the sidewalks have that at least between 5 to 15% um, brick incorporated into the sidewalks. Um, you've seen that um, in the plaza spaces and some of the other areas of, of uh, Sugar House um, with a brick pattern incorporated into the sidewalks. Um, this proposal would also clarify that street trees are required. Um, that's come up a few times that um, people don't think that the street trees are required in this zone, um, but they are, so we're making that more clear in the zoning ordinance. Um, and we're putting in a, a provision to allow for paved park, and park strips in some circumstances if um, it follows the circulation and streetscape amenities plan um, and it is subject to planning director approval. So and again, with the other standards, all these are currently allowed or required through the design review on larger buildings. And with putting these in the zoning code itself, they would be required for any building, large or small. Um, Question, go ahead. if you have a smaller building and it's like one building in the middle of a block, the rest of the block's not been redeveloped, that building has to build out the sidewalk to the standard, whereas the rest of the block will stay as is? Yes. Yep, it's incremental, and that's kind of how it works right now. Um, unless the city has a, another special improvement district where we're putting in the sidewalks ourselves, we get wider sidewalks with new development. Right, but the new development usually is a continuous, it's a large area where it's going to control for a large building. So I just... It, there is a potential, yeah, that you would have a, a small segment six feet or eight feet, and then the rest five feet. Yeah, the minimum standard for any development in a commercial district is six feet, so it's kind of a base standard. If someone's cutting into the park strips, they would have to end up putting back um, a six-foot sidewalk. That would be just required through engineering and wouldn't be required through zoning. Um, but the eight-foot requirement would be different. So outside of like Wasatch uh, Pub on, the, on, on Highland Drive, is that a, how wide is that sidewalk? Six feet? Eight feet. It feels narrow. I don't even like because I was there with my kids. I was like, it was really narrow. On the corner of Twenty First and sorry, on the yeah, corner. yeah, on Wasatch Pub, like on Highland, there are doors you enter right there at the view. I think it's eight Six plus. Is that, is that still eight feet right? Yeah, there? yeah, and you have the additional um, paving with the um, tree grates as well. So that adds <laughs> three or four feet as well. If you're on the high, Highland side. And then the sidewalk that goes in front on McClelland, though, that goes all the way down, McClelland is a usual four-foot sidewalk, right? I think it's about five feet. Yeah, it's five feet. Yeah, yeah, it's five, feet. five feet with about two feet park strip. Um, 
and with new development, we've gotten um, six feet in some projects and, and eight feet on the most recent project, um, the Fairmont building that came through last year. What if you're talking about an infill project, which, you know, you, do we have a build two line for the, for the Sugar House District? So you have a build two line and you only have five feet between there and the right of way line. So in that case, they would be required. The street requ line. Yeah. Actually, all of it's right away line. But so in that case, they would be required to pave a foot or two into their property. So they wouldn't have the build two line anymore. So the build two line is within. You'd have you have to build within 15 feet of the front property line. So there is some wiggle room. So you don't have to build right to the property line in Sugar House. So they w they could shift it back a foot or two. And leave a. A 30-foot stretch of property with one-foot wider sidewalk? Yeah, you could. One other component of this is the sign, st sign standards modifications. Um, we are proposing an increase in the size limit, height limit, uh, for eye-level wayfinding signs. Um, the current requirement for allowance for those signs is fairly low, um, and you can't make them eye level, so we'd be increasing that to a seven foot tall. And again, wayfinding signs are generally required through the design review process. Um, this is just a graphic showing all of the proposed new design standards um, with the existing ones shown in yellow. So there's a lot of new design standards, and there's only currently four um, design standards in Sugar House, and that is the upper building step back, that you have that 15 foot step back at building portions over 30 feet in height. Um, blank wall limitations, you can't have a blank wall longer than 15 feet. Um, we do require mecha mechanical equipment screening currently, and there's a 40 foot um, length, or 40, sorry, 40% 40, 40 of your ground floor has to be glass. Um, additionally, that's not shown here, is that there is a building entrance requirement for at least one um, building entry on your facade, rather than a minimum 40, one every 40 feet. Um, so the, the Planning Commission discussions in December, um, we talked about sidewalk widths, building lengths, um, door spacing. Um, so just quickly, the reason for the sidewalk width proposal is that it follows existing city subdivision policies um, that impose six feet in commercial areas and eight feet in central business district areas. Um, so the, the zoning will now match the subdivision policies for sidewalks. Um, it does align with the Sugar House Business District design guidelines, which call for six feet. Um, in lower intensity areas and eight feet in the higher intensity areas in Sugar House. And it is within the ranges of the National Association of uh, Transportation Officials, um, which also uh, propose simi have similar ranges for the recommendations. Um, the building length limit, the reason why we went with 30 feet, 300 feet, has been, it has been the standard for 10 years um, and generally has worked out um, with development, we think, um, and getting new circulation through Sugar House. Um, the 30 feet, 300 feet, rather, spacing limitation also aligns up with the proposed paths in the circulation plan. They're all separated by approximately 300 feet. Um, additionally, buildings under this length generally are subject to the design review process anyway because of the square footage limitation. So if there are some concerns that we'll end up with monotonous um, building facades, um, those buildings will have to get reviewed by this body anyway for visual interest. Um, the one concern is that the lower threshold of perhaps 200 feet could result in additional unnecessary paths that may not link up with other paths on other surrounding developments. Um, or additional modification requests from people going through the process. Um, door spacing, again, we did revise from 40 feet to 30 feet. Um, we looked at the average spacing of new buildings in Sugar House, and generally the average has been about 45 feet. Um, so 40 feet does reflect a more realistic expectation for door spacing. Um, a 30 foot potentially could lead to additional locked doors or just odd design decisions for door placement on facades. Um, as far as public input, um, recent, uh, more recent public input, uh, we did receive um, concerns from a developer about the ground floor use limitation especially um, for the 1100 East and 21st South restriction on residential dwelling units. Um, it is a fact mixed use can be more financially difficult and riskier than just a pure residential project, especially for a lower scale building. Um, 
Additionally, Sugar House Community Council would like to see a 30-foot door spacing and a 200-foot um, maximum building length limit. So that's about all I have for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions any questions. Questions for Daniel? Daniel, I wanted to um, follow up on our previous discussion. Mm -hmm. And did you look at um, putting some sort of qualifier for that 40% glass that it not be above five, that it not start above five feet? So yes, there is an existing qualifier that says that 40% has to be within three, the three foot height level and eight foot high level. So it's at a person's so, eye level. So then the, the Walgreens that started it at five feet, did that come, does, would that comply now? That, no, I, th I think, oh, uh, you're saying, okay, I see, I see what, you're being, what you're saying now. Potentially, I suppose they could do that. No, I, I, yeah, we have not looked at a qualifier to make sure that they don't start it at, five, at the five-foot level rather than down below. I don't think we've ever seen that except maybe on that project, if that's well, what they did. Well, CVS wanted to do that, too, and we, yeah. this is before me being on here, but we fought that pretty hard. Yeah. Maybe it's the, just pharmacies, but um, <laughs> that seems to be the trend. But I, but I do think one of the impetus when I was really involved in the community council was I mean, we wanted this design because there was so much. There was like, hey, this was the intent, and the developer would be like, well, this is what the code says. We don't care what your intent is. So we need to, you know, clarify that a little bit more. And the glass was always one of those things that they was like, well, I meant the forty percent, and it was placed in a, a position that literally did nothing to enhance that pedestrian activation. And if the whole goal of having forty percent glass is to activate that streetscape for the pedestrian and you don't have any sort of qualifying language to clarify the intent the, it is like then becomes this battle at the community level first off is like well that why are you putting it way up there or why are you putting it off in this side um and that is i would still like to see some sort of um, clarification of the intent of why you have a 40 percent glass okay. and and then, unfortunately, now we've seen, and I've fought with a developer over, like where it got placed in that three to five or three to eight foot. And when you started at five feet, for someone like me, it doesn't. I can't see in there, um, so it doesn't help activate anything. If that's the intent of having forty percent glass, if that's not the intent of forty percent glass, then that's fine. But the thing that needs to be spelled out a little bit better. We could potentially put a footnote in the table. Um, where it says 40 and put a footnote that I don't know what the exact wording would be, but something uh, evenly distributed. I'm not sure how we would word that. Um, well, is, well but, I guess I'm asking could, you, is the intent to... It has to start at, say, four feet. I mean, yeah, it, right. it can't, it can't eight, start. It can't be. Any. It can't start above four feet. So it needs to be placed between three to eight feet, but it can't start above four. Actually, most it, store windows are like six inches to two feet. Well, you would ground. think that, but come to Sugar House and you will see that's not how. But it's I mean, you, if you say you must start at three feet, then that's no. But that that's what it currently too. says now. It's between three to eight feet, right? Between, yeah, the, the calculation feet, is done between the three and eight the 40 foot. The 40% glass can be found between three to eight feet. But if there's some sort of qualifier that says, like, you can't start your glass above four foot, I don't know. It is the intent. Let me ask you, <laughs> is the intent to activate pedestrian um, experience to do the 40% glass, or am I off base there? No, it, it completely is. Um, so maybe you don't need to be so like it has to be this this but because right now it's just like we require 40 percent glass and i think there there there's a need to qualify what that means in an intent and it doesn't necessarily have to translate into like this many feet and inches da, 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 with your tape measure but yeah um if a footnote to just kind of address that because i only bring this up again is because this was a consistent issue for almost every development that came forward gotcha and we had pushed back from a handful and then it's pharmacies that are just 
don't want it. But, um, but that was, you know, one of the reasons why the community was asking for some of these clarifications so that developers had a better understanding of what we were trying to get at. Yeah. One, one way to potentially resolve that would be to just simply increase the percentage requirement. Um, by doing that, you'd likely get glass would essentially have to come lower than three feet from the eight foot and, and start to get lower. But it, it's, so it's if, hard to... Yeah, I, think, I don't know if that's, the, if that's the answer. So if a developer came and they wanted less than that for various reasons, um, they could then get that approved via... A conditional use or they could go through a design review process i don't, I don't it, know it that it needs to be increased i think you just need to add some clarifying language that spells out what the intent of having 40 percent glass means so that then if a developer is like well i'm just going to start it up here you're like well that's not meeting the intent of activating the pedestrian experience if yeah. most pedestrians who are not as tall as weston can't see <laughs> it then you have not achieved the intent yeah so, so to keep it so simple, but maybe you can add that to your recommendation. Yeah. Good. And anyone else? Can you point out some of the areas where the 300 foot length like doesn't work? And I'm sorry if you did this in the tour. Where where it hasn't worked, or yeah, it's just been an ongoing concern of discussion um, point. I mean, I mean, you said that you know the problem is that some of the areas with my developer. You know, they're at 300 feet where we've got these kind of breakup areas, and that means you might end up with weird breaks. That was your argument, why we shouldn't do a 200-foot one, which is what we talked about before. And so I'm wondering if you just kind of point to me to where those problems would occur. So what we have had happen is that 300-foot-long buildings have been coming to the commission for special approvals because they're going over the 200-foot limit. Um, in particular, you've had two or three developments in the TSA zone that have come in, um, they're 300 feet long, but at 300 feet, they either meet a mid-block walkway or they line up with an existing mid-block street. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense to then have a 200 foot long building, another walkway through the block, and then a 100 foot long building. Um, it's made sense, and the commission's approved the 300 foot long building because it does line up with those circulation paths. Um, How does that apply to these two? Because we're talking about a pretty confined part of town. I'll be honest, like, I'm, I voted, I don't know if I voted for it. I have to look at that and see, but I'm really disappointed in the Sugar Mount project. It's like massive. I mean, it just, you see, the, especially, we, I mean, we had concerns going through and watching it kind of get executed. I mean, it is just, it is overwhelming, you know, uh, in its sort of scope and, um, and even some of its design. I mean, granted, like the elements are not on it, so it looks more like old, old like Soviet project than it going to be eventually. <laughs> but like, um, and I just that like I, that's just like weighing, you know, it's been the, it's been the reason why you know we we objected, oh, I objected before, and why it's on my mind, especially we review this again. So I'm kind of curious why, you know. Breaking that up as the other side of McClellan kind of develops, which is not, um, I guess it's sort of in here. Um, I'm just curious, like, where, 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 where a 200 or 250 foot marker really causes problems. It would just essentially re probably lead to more modification requests um, through the conditional building and site design review. And there may be buildings that you're going to see anyway. Come through here, right? Yes, yes. Um, not the worst thing in the world is it <laughs> it's not necessarily um and, and we've to that point we've done project i mean we i remember one on a dsa zone where we um where the barnes building or barnes bank building was yes and 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 we made that modification at the end and i think you know i don't think limiting the facade length and maybe it's the language here but to 200 feet doesn't necessarily say you need a you need a pedestrian walkway, but it's we want to change the look of the building dramatically so that it's not so it's broken up so it's not the same look for 300 feet. So there's two components to that. Um, through the design review process, with the very new changes that we have, um, buildings that are over 200 feet in length are reviewed for modulation and changes in the in the facade. 
um, so that you're not just having a more monotonous building. Um, the th but then you have, in the design standards chapter, if you impose a 200 foot long length building length limit, there is a requirement that you then have a 20 foot wide space between the end of your building and any subsequent building that you're showing on your proposal with a five foot walkway um, for pedestrians at a minimum. Um, so it does, if you, yeah, so you, it does impose an additional actual break in the building that you'd be modifying somehow. Th this, this does? Or? Yes, okay. this does, yes. So at 300 feet of length, they would have to do a 20 foot wide break um, with a five foot walkway. And this is changing that to this, 300. This is imposing 300. There's no... Keeping the, it the same. It's right keeping now. the same essentially as, as what as how we've been reviewing buildings in the past. It's currently, there's no number in that box. To avoid that, that ruling or the 20-foot break with a 5-foot pedestrian thing if you came through this, this body. You, ask, you, could ask ask for, you could ask for modification, yes. Um, so there's no, currently in the code, it's clear, there is no requirement for a 20-foot wide walkway um, for buildings in Sugar House after you hit a maximum length of building, this would be imposing that at 300 feet. You could impose it at 200 feet. Well, I don't know, the, I don't know that we want to impose that at 200 feet. We want, we just, I just don't. Daniel, you know, like, I hate long buildings. Break, <laughs> it's imposing the, the breaking the building. It's imposing like the design look, feel, and um, what the building is. I mean, that, that's, that's a different, that, I think that's a very different, um, that's a up. different idea here. A 300 foot long facade is a pretty long facade and after you're, I mean that's a, a half a block here or, or to, to a mid block walkway, you know, there's, there's no block face in downtown that's 300 feet long without a break, I don't think. There's very few, few. South. Very but few, so maybe. <laughs> um, but, and, Huh? And McClellan. McClellan's 330. Well, 330 is half of a Salt Lake City block, so that's what makes sense. You know, if you take out... So I actually think that that 300 is a, is a good number, and you should have a break. There should be some kind of a break there. But I think it's actually more important that those breaks align with whatever the circulation plan is than it is any particular length. In other words, if there's a circulation plan that says here's where the mid-block walkways sort of go, then that's where the length of the building ought to end. Then why not keep the, the break requirement at 300 feet but require a change in facade. facade and look and feel at 200 feet or whatever? I already that, do that. It would, yes. So any building that's over 200 feet would have to go through the design review process, which was just barely adopted by the city. Okay. And there's a requirement at 200 feet, that building has to be reviewed for facade interest and modulation. Um, if Molly remembers more details from that, yeah, there's, feel free to. <laughs> there's three things that you have to include for a building that has a combined contiguous building length of more than 200 feet. And those three things are changes in vertical plane, so breaks in the facade, um, material changes, and massing changes. So, you know, you're looking for that push-pull yeah. type That's of code, thing. Yeah. That is in the, des the new design review ordinance. So for anything over 200 feet. And the, I you know, the idea, because that's going to apply outside of Sugar House Business District, um, you're going to get larger buildings throughout the city um, that are more than 200 feet. They're going through the design review process. We allow that building to be longer than 200 feet, but you've got to do these three things so that you don't have this monotonous, boring experience as you're moving along. Next so, time. Molly, who does the design review in the city? Uh, you do. You not, do. For, not for this kind of thing, though. Yeah, so the new design review ordinance... Um, has has it defines two paths 
One of those paths is for smaller modifications. Somebody just wants to modify their ground floor glass, that can be approved administratively as long as they're meeting the applicable standard. Um, but for any height um, request for, there's another one, and then for all you know, in Sugar House where the trigger is already written into the zoning code, the, all of those would be reviewed by the Planning Commission. And that would and that would be the design review? There isn't an additional design review? No. Oh. We don't have a separate design review board. Trust us, Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust myself. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no, we don't. Here we for don't hours have, and hours and hours. And it's, unfortunately, no, we don't have a separate design review board. Okay. I move we have a separate design review board. <laughs> <laughs> I move, that, I don't that. Think it's I move the that the planning commission recommend to the city council that we need a separate design review board so we're not inundated with requests for. Um, Design, design issues des that are, are outside design our scope. issues that are outside the scope of our standard planning operations. I would agree. By a group of people who really <laughs> don't have. Is that a I, real motion? Yes. Why no. can't it be? <laughs> because it's not on the agenda. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. But it's on the agenda. Okay. Our theoretical so, motion, if given the chance. So make a recommendation to staff to put that on the agenda if you At want. At some point when I'm going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to be gone all of July, right? Yeah, I am. Um, so, okay, let's let's try to move on here a little bit. My only last quick. So it's six feet in the pink areas and eight feet for the sidewalks. Sorry. Yes. Eight feet in the yellows. Yes. Um. You feel like an eight foot sidewalk in the pink areas is a is a problem, or is, is it six feet with a park strip too, or is it just six feet? Total. It's six feet, and then if there's a park strip required, then it's measured to that edge of park strip. Park strip. If there's pavement involved um, and tree grates, then we can measure that to the tree itself. So that helps in some of the difficult situations so where there's some constraints. It's like a seven or eight foot barrier between sidewalk and a road, or you've got a tree. Is that what you're telling me? I mean, just I'm trying to figure out what the effective impact is in the pink area. From the property line, from the front property line, um, you'd have. If there's a park strip. If there's a park strip, then you would have eight feet of Are sidewalk. Areas where there's not a park sure. strip in that area. But if there's not a net, because in this area there's not necessarily a park strip, um, you could ask to just do paving, um, which is the case in front of the Wasatch where they just did paving with trees. Um, in that case, you have eight feet, and then you have an additional four feet um, that is the tree grates and then paving. Like a park strip. That's so total, total, you end up having about 12 feet between the front of the building and the street itself. Um, okay. I, I mean, I don't know why. I just, because I was walking around, I was like, the, some of these sidewalks sort of feel super narrow and... And maybe that's fine, but maybe six feet is enough. I'm having a hard time visualizing it, but okay. On the east side of the view, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that is super narrow. It, it feels very, very narrow. I agree with you. Oh, go to McClelland. Yeah, yeah. The McClelland's that way too. That's yeah. extremely narrow, and yeah, the park strip right. is rock, so yeah. you can't even utilize it as an extension to the, to the sidewalk because it's rocks. Well, so, with, so with kids, I'd yeah, if you have a stroller, you, kids well, don't run over the rocks. They don't understand. Yeah. Stay on the on the sidewalk. Right. They're not the brightest group. Can I <laughs> um, can I also ask a question? Uh, I want to. Uh, it's something that uh, came to me today when we were on the site for this particular project, and that was the fact that there um, those t two buildings, um, the, the the building they were building was sort of set into another big building, uh, both of them around 80 feet tall. And the distance between them, uh, I think I figured was around 50 feet in one place or maybe even slightly less, 45 feet or so. 
And I am wondering whether or not, especially with, I mean, we don't do, we, this isn't a is, big issue downtown, number one, because um, the streets are very wide anyway. And number two, because uh, most people build in a, in a way that's, um, um, well, has party party walls and so forth, but where you don't have a party wall, there it seems to me there should be some se required separation between the between two buildings. And right now we don't have that. And, and in fact, the very first zoning code in the world, New York City, that's one of the main th main things they did was to create this you know this height limit relative to the width of the street or the width of the separation between the two buildings. And I think that, I'm not proposing it for now, but I'm thinking that those guys could have built those buildings, you know, 10 feet apart. And they wouldn't do it because it's not in their interest to do it, but um, they could have built them a lot closer together than a lot of us would have wanted. So, um, and you're saying, you know, we have us 300 feet and then 20 feet. Well, are there any apartments on that? 20 feet, 20 foot wide break that look out into the 20 feet. Well, they could, and you got an 85 foot building with a 20 foot break. Ick. Maybe that's okay for an office building, but certainly for a residential, you wouldn't want that to happen. And yet, you don't want blank walls there either. So, I mean, I think you have. We need to be, be start thinking about that, particularly in Sugar House, but everywhere really. Um, particularly in Sugar House, thinking about how far apart these buildings need to be in order to preserve, preserve light and air down into the, the desk between them. And just thinking of, of other zones in the city, I'm not sure that we necessarily have anything that's significant, that requires significant spacing um, for apartment buildings. I think we have some zones where we require maybe a four foot, four or five foot set back from the property line so you essentially end up with eight to ten feet between yeah, buildings right. between you can look at well, your neighbors and there are and fire code, code, code exactly. separations too yeah but um what what that what, if you start thinking about it this way you start to have to think about you know how far back to somebody who's putting windows on a property line yeah you know can they do that that means the guy next door to them can't do anything i have my my curtains closed all the time. I have a neighbor 20, 20 feet away. And yeah. So <laughs> I do think are that we, closed. we are getting to the point in our evolution as a city where, you know, we didn't have six-story apartment buildings sure. 20, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, but now we've got 10-story. We've got even 20-story office uh, buildings. And so, like I said, in downtown, that's not so much a problem, but I think in areas like Sugar House where it's densifying very rapidly and where the buildings are, you know, 88 feet tall as this case was, you wouldn't want somebody to make a 20 foot alley and then put another 88 foot story building there, but they could do it. They could right now, yep. Anything else pertinent to this particular proposal? No? Make a move up. Still pu public hearing still. Let's go to the public hearing. <laughs> Dan, step back for me, please. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing on this item. I have two cards up here. Judy? Listening to you two, you all rattle on, reminded me why it was difficult to get much public comment for this concept, because it just makes your eyes glaze over. It's very complicated. So how big is a 300-foot building? It's the size of a football field. I mean, do you want that in your neighborhood? Maybe you don't live in Sugar House, but... That's too long. Lynn and I were looking at the legacy this afternoon, which is the one, the tall building on Sugar or Wilmington, and that building is not even 200 feet long, and it seems enormous. So I really wish Daniel could figure out a way 
that it could be allowed to be less than 200. I mean, why does everybody feel like the developers have to get the most they can and they build it as big as they can? If we make it 300, they might build it 300. And if the point of this is to codify the business district too, which is the short stuff and the small, quaint stuff that Sugar House is made of, do we want that to all of a sudden be 200 feet long? I don't like it. I could give you a list of all those buildings where the glass got modified and didn't meet the intent of the standards. I mean, Smith's has their glass 15 feet up as a clear story thing along Elm Avenue. I mean, we can't make this stuff up. They think of it, and it drives us crazy. So I think you have to be more specific than just 40% glass. You need to say that it's clear, unobstructed glass. Because they'll paint it on the inside, like the DI did, or they'll make it into uh, window boxes, like we have along 21st South, which doesn't do anything. Who wants to look at just a dress in a box that's 12 inches deep? So I think there needs some more specificity here. Um, we wanted active main entrances every 30 feet, and this somehow has morphed to 40 feet. I don't think, I think 40 feet's almost too far. Look at the size of what we have now in those small areas along 11th East. They still can't build any taller than 30 feet. So why would they need to be 40 feet apart? Sidewalks. Side sidewalks, at one point I should have brought my hand out. We actually went around and measured sidewalks in various places in Sugar House. And McClellan's a bad street. I mean, those are like five barely. And you can't get a mother, a father, a bike, and a dog, and somebody's pushing a baby carriage. You just can't, and then somebody's coming the other direction. So I think wherever it's possible, we should make them wider. The new uh, CVS actually did 10 feet, and I've heard comments that, gee, nobody walks there. Well, of course they don't. It's not a walkable area but they at least put the 10 feet sidewalks in. And maybe if something else redevelops, I mean, the more wider sidewalks we can build, even if it's only for 50 feet, I think we're better off. So I guess that's all I have to say. I just think there needs to be some kind of flexibility. I get the fact that, I mean, maybe there's a sentence you can add uh, your building can't be longer than 200 feet unless there's an active walkway, in which case it can only be 175, or something like that. I don't, you know, I don't quite know. I'd have to see. You'd have to see a map. But I would think you guys have to put up with some design review to get a little better design. Maybe. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. We have Lynn Schwartz. State your name for the record and you'll have two minutes. My name is Lynn Schwartz. I'm vice chair of the Sugar House Community Council Land Use and Zoning Committee. Um, please forgive me if I repeat some of the things that Judy has said because we've been chewing this over for a while. And I'd also like to thank Daniel for his very, very hard work and always being accessible. Uh, well, I'm happy to see a codified design standard so that elements of the master plan could be included. It is disappointing to see that there are many things that we had requested as the community council that were not included. Um, speaking again, repeating the 300-foot uh, facade, uh, which just is way, way, way too long. The sidewalks, uh, six and eight foot, are 
way too narrow. And the door placement of 40 feet, we, as was stated before, should be 30 feet. We're very happy to see that the um, height for signs was increased and that the tree requirement was clarified. Um, and uh, we don't think that the live work substitution for retail would necessarily increase pedestrian um, interest uh, having an accountant or a podiatrist or a lawyer's office. Uh, we don't see how that would increase pedestrian interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I have a card from Lori Karlick. State your name for the record and you'll have two minutes. Hi, I'm Lori Karlick and I work for Gardner Properties. So um, I commented on the Urban on 11th project when you guys were kind of searching for wondering which one it was. So John wanted to be here today, John Gardner. Um, he couldn't be. He did uh, provide a letter, which you should all have a copy of now. And uh, for the most part, I'm going to read parts of that letter. Um, thank you for hearing me, Planning Commission members. We are, are opposed to the proposed zoning, zoning ordinance changing certain parts of the Sugar House Business District Ordinance. Generally, the existing ordinance has served the community very well since its passage in 2005 by spawning favorable redevelopment of Sugar House. We were the first to build condos and apartments under the ordinance and are such our pioneering, um, a, a pioneering developer of this process, having completed three projects, Urbana on 11th condos, Sugar House apartments by Urbana, and 21 by Urbana, which is the project on 2100 South. Generally, the ordinance does not need changing, and certain modifications proposed by the planning department will be harmful to the community. The mandate commercial space on front of buildings on 1100 East and 2100 South. Dictating to landowners that they must have commercial on the main level is a bad idea. This portion of mixed-use projects has weak economic feasibility and a poor track record. Such spaces are particularly non-feasible for smaller buildings as the space is just not big enough for a retailer. Please do not pass this change that will make development of, of small parcels very difficult. The burden of this non-economic space, if the project can even be developed with this deadweight burden, must be added to the cost of the residential units, thus increasing the cost of housing. Uh, my understanding is that Salt Lake City is concerned about affordable housing, so passing this ordinance will increase the cost of housing in Sugar House. And uh, Judy mentioned in the last couple months we've lost a couple retail shops. We lost um, the eyeglass shop and design details, um, and they were both on 1100 East. Our latest project on 2100 South, uh, 21 by Urbana, has our lobby, our leasing office, and a cyber cafe, <coughs> and also two walk-up residential units, which are all very successful. Lots of activity on street level, and the people are on their balconies at night. This type of development would be banned under the new ordinance proposed. Um, no good reason for banning such developments. We've got... Um, one particular resident who put a, put a fire pit out front and uh, had had a party on Saturday night right there on 2100 South. So um, maybe some of the neighbors didn't like it, but thanks. That's I definitely about brought thank you. Seats. That's your two minutes. Thank you. Okay, we're also would like to see the sidewalks stay at five so that the mature trees can stay in place. Thank you. Okay, is anyone else in the audience wanting to speak on this topic? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing, bring it back up to the commission. Any, do you want Dan to come back? I do have a couple questions, unless I am yeah. tarred and feathered by the commission for holding us longer. We might. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I'll take. I'll take one for the city. Um, Two minutes. <laughs> the the tree tree removal thing. What it, that does the increasing size of 
sidewalks, is that going to have any impact on the trees? So generally, if there's some if there's some obstruction in the way, they would have to shift their sidewalk around the obstruction if that tree is is staying. Um, generally, urban forestry um, requires you to save the trees, um, so we generally have to stay. Um, we did build in some flexibility into the ordinance to take that into consideration um, as far as where um, it is the sidewalk what's measured from to the tree. Um, but if the tree was super close to the property, they would have to then shift the sidewalk maybe a foot into the property. Um, we do have, so there's some other avenues where they could modify the sidewalk width requirement. We do have a provision in the landscape ordinance that allows the zoning administrator to uh, modify zoning requirements by 20%. So if the six foot provision is causing a problem, they could reduce the sidewalk down to four feet, uh, 4.8 feet, um, to avoid any conflict with the tree. Um, we could add additional language to clarify um, that trees can't be removed because of a sidewalk requirement. I, I mean, do you in, believe in, that the system in place would give deference to the tree generally? I generally, mean, I, I would yes. Be super strict on it because there, there probably are some strange situations that there, the tree doesn't make sense. But generally, I would. Yeah, generally, it's better. it's it's more difficult to just remove a, a street tree, um, and we do have protections in there for zoning administrator um, to do some modifications on sidewalk and planning director to also do modifications. Um, for example, I think there are some side streets that it may be difficult. Um, and in those side streets, the circulation plan may provide us some flexibility as far as the sidewalk widths, acknowledging that our right-of-ways aren't very wide there. Um, so the planning director could also approve a modification. So we, we put that language in, in there because we understand the concern about the trees. We don't want to lose those trees either. Um, okay. So. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, and we we get this question all the time about the feasibility of about retail and like we haven't I don't have any idea right and um, I mean I would generally want to lean on ensuring that there is space for that opportunity at some point and not close it off and 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 make it something that will never be active like retail um, and I do worry about live workspaces a little bit because I've seen them go bad where they do just kind of turn into an apartment and they put up blinds and they don't actually have a workspace. So then it really is just a residential space on the ground floor. Are there any protections in the definition of what a live workspace is to So we, that? we did put a qualifier in there that the workspace has to be on the ground floor um, so that that space would be next to the street, thinking of that potential situation. Um, and that live work provision was put there because we understand that it can be difficult to get financing for a mixed use product. Um, and this would be an option um, for a residential developer um, to maybe get financing easier, easier um, without the risk of a purely commercial space on the ground floor um, because it can potentially increase costs and increase the cost for the units above if the commercial space isn't leasing. Hmm. So is it really, I mean, I guess for projects of the size, I, I just question whether it's really an issue. I mean, if you develop or codify the design standards and go with more of a form-based approach, as long as you have the form you want, why are we so concerned with the specific uses for um, small projects? For, for example, if you had a small project, small property in the core of Sugar House on Highland Drive, um, but how Purely many of those are there? There could be, there are a few pockets where we do have small properties, especially on the east side of Highland Drive. Um, not a lot. Not a lot is left. Um, but you could end up with. You can do a nice looking residential unit on the ground floor with a nice patio. Um, but if you're looking for the ground level activation, you're not going to see the same level of ground activation with. A residential product versus a commercial space versus a restaurant or but retailer. But all I'm saying is the market will determine if that commercial space is viable. It, but it would. I, but if I, we're mandating that it's commercial, the other option is it's just a blank hole. That's all I'm saying. It could be. That is a risk, and that's we have to acknowledge that risk. 
Uh-uh. Um, and the only reason we impose the, the commercial, we're proposing the commercial requirement is because um, there's language in the master plan that so strongly talks about preserving the commercial core and commercial activity in the core of Sugar House. Um, so that's why, that's why it's in there, but we can't ignore it. So there is a potential for it to be I've problematic. I've been mulling that over as well, and I feel really strongly that we're only talking about 21st South, 11th East, and Highland Drive. So when I count projects that we've approved or that are currently being built, not ones that have completed, we've got seven. Only one of them has retail, and that's the one we just approved tonight. So we have a business district. It's called the business district, and we're not building businesses. We, we're, this current trend is not building businesses. And if we talk about retail feasibility, along Island Drive, 11th East, and 21st South, I can count four empty spots that I know of. That's it. So to say that we're, we're failing retail isn't um, accurate. And I have to wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, Adrian, but I've what I've seen as a trend isn't like the market doesn't seem to be driving what's being built there. In some regards, we have developers who are really comfortable doing retail, and then we have other developers who are really comfortable doing residential. And we don't have a lot that are really comfortable doing both. And I get that for large projects, and where that to me makes a lot of sense, where you've got 200 feet, 300 feet, you want to make sure that that's an active use. If you've got 20 feet, I just don't see Yeah, but we're, we're talking about 11th East, 21st South, and Highland Drive. We don't have, in the business district, we have houses that have been, in, that would qualify for those small, that have been modified to be a business. And um, we want to keep them as a business. And and to have and and we've seen it the the one on that was built on 21st South and 10th East. There's no activation. The one on McClelland has no retail. There's no going. There's not going to be any activation to that pedestrian. And so, and so we're only talking about this core where there's very few open spaces now in terms of retail. They're all taken, but we have opportunities mostly in business district too. I would say that. Um, qualify for this small but they're currently businesses and I would like to keep them businesses and if they want to do residential on top you know that's that's great but along 11th East and those those main cores I think this is appropriate there's a ton of areas still in both those business districts that this isn't going to apply to where if they're small they can not have retail on the floor we're really talking about the core of the business district as people move and circulate. And I'm really comfortable with that because we want to see those remain businesses. Um, because I've seen the projects that don't have businesses on the ground floor and they're not, there's no activation period at all, nothing. And um, why would we have a business district if we're not trying to have businesses in there? And that's, that's, that's been the trend. Lately. And I should clarify that requirement would apply to large and small. If that, I'm not sure if that's clear, but all any development, Brenda, regardless of size. Do you have something? Um, just want to not take up much time, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'm sorry, Paul. Um, and I apologize to everybody in the audience too for being wordy. Um, so one of the th- one of the trends that we're seeing now is that business, so to speak, is changing quite greatly, and that in terms of commercial areas, we're not getting any, we're not even getting, you're not getting business, you're not even getting commercial retail in those areas. You're getting restaurants, and that's the only thing that you're getting. So um, along those streets, and so. And that's just an observation. It's not a, you know, so and so. Um, but I think there's um, the the trend is that that actual retail businesses are shrinking greatly moment by moment, and we know this. 
So I, I think if you look to places like Boston or New York or other San Francisco, places that are developed with residential everywhere, uh, you will see that walking along a street in, in New York or in San Francisco or even Chicago in many places is not boring. It's not activated in the sense that everybody's out, you know, swinging through town, but it, isn't also, it is also not boring to walk. So I think if you wanted to have a smaller uh, residential project that had residential kinds of, uh, that, that was, you know, a, a building like you would find on, um, in many parts of New York where you walk in and it's a, you know, uh, and there are apartments all over it, you know, I think this is, this is not a bad thing for Sugar House. Um, so I would be, um, I would be, uh, I, I do think over a certain length, yes, but uh, under, under a certain size, I don't see that it has to be uh, retail, it's because basically then you're making sure that every single person in a small building has to sit with a restaurant underneath them. So, Brenda, that the, the who the tenant is is related to the property owner. I agree. I don't want to see all these um, restaurants, but that's who they're renting to. They, well, no, there could be more diversity, but the, the property owners either don't care or they just want a tenant. No, no, you, you're missing my dying. point, which is that retail in general is shrinking all over the United States. The, the market for retail is shrinking. Yeah, but I think if you look along the business district too, along 11th East where those houses have been converted, you are seeing smaller retail and those smaller projects, if you take away their opportunity for retail, nobody's they, they end up creeping. Nobody's, no, nobody's taking, taking it, away. it away, we're just not requiring it. Yeah, I, I feel comfortable with these core streets having a retail component. The rest of the business district, and there's a lot of it, um, along the side streets, it wouldn't apply to them. So. Okay. Can somebody make a motion with, recommend, it's a recommendation. Yeah, I'll make a recommendation. Well, you need to make a motion. Well, a motion, with that's. With a recommendation. The recomm yeah. Okay. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve PLN PCM 2018-00219 Sugar House Business District Design Standards Text Amendment with the additional condition that you clarify the intent for the glass percentage requirements. Do we have a second? No second. Do we have a substitute motion? <laughs> I can't make a motion. Come on. I mean, it's just a recommendation, but I, I still, the 200, 300 foot building thing is still, um, I don't know. I, I, but, I, but I haven't. I haven't processed, processed it enough to be able to provide good feedback other than our buildings are too long, our facades are too long. And I get your point, and I, and I probably just need to give it up um, for this space. But does anyone else share the concern, or is everyone else like, am I the only one that continues to be angry at 300-foot buildings? I hate of buildings, but like I've been, I was relieved by the design standards that Molly mentioned that yeah. there are other avenues to address it. So, but do we need something in there that gives us more tools to address it appropriately, or is that is that enough? What Molly said, I mean, it may perhaps it is. Me and to me, it sounds like it's been the 300 foot thing has been reduced down to 200 feet. At least the, the problems that I experience with a 300 foot building, like I don't mind that it's a building, it, but it's just that it's one building. Okay. It doesn't, doesn't feel like there's a difference. And so I, f I feel like what's been described, and Molly was the one that showed us the, the Denmark homes. And yeah. And, that looks and, great. and is there... And that's what we're going for. Using the, the three standards that you said that we would be able to address that with, are there, are there 
cheap ways for developers to get around it that don't really, you know, they like sure. make the facade go this almost, way and then this way and this definitely. way and this way and then it becomes repetitive in another way? Or does it is there give us enough flexibility to be like, you're trying to get around the, the intent here? It, will it, certainly it, it would be up to you to decide whether or not you feel they met that standard to your, that is a to good your answer. satisfaction. Okay, I like that answer. Did, okay. I'm going to second Amy's notion, motion, sorry. Her notion? Motion. Her motion. Notion. What did you add to it? The glass standard. The glass. glass. Clarification. Okay. okay. Any discussion on the motion? Um, let's take a vote. Matt. Yes. Amy. Yes. Weston. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Brenda. Yes. Adrian. Thank you. It's not going to affect more than one or two buildings. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>